Good afternoon. Welcome to the last lecture, lecture 11. Today we will talk about labor, crisis, and trade. So we'll have three different topics. Before we get started, let me catch you up with what we said last time. So previously, in economics and society, we talked about the commodity market, the households, the firms, the government, and the foreign sector as the participants in the commodity market. And then we talked about the equilibrium in the commodity market, the equilibrium condition when total production Y is equal to total expenditure C plus I plus G. Then we established the links between the markets. We said that there is the first link that connects output with interest rate through the money demand. And then we said that there is link two, the second link, the reverse of link one, which connects the interest rate with output through investment. So we have one link that takes us from the commodity market to the money market through the money demand, and the second link that takes us from the money market to the commodity market through investment. Then we said that the government can use that uh, connection between the markets and conduct policy. For example, they can increase G or they can decrease T, and we can call that expansionary fiscal policy, or they can do the reverse, decrease G or increase T, and uh, in this way they could ease inflation or protect the economy from overheating in general. Then we said that the Central bank can also do policy. We call this monetary policy. They do it through adjusting the money supply. And then they can also accommodate policy from the government. So the central bank can accommodate policy from the government. And finally, we said that one of the most basic roles of the central bank is to stabilize the economy. And finally, we closed lecture then by talking briefly about unemployment and introducing the topic of today's discussion that we will start with a labor market and we will try to analyze what is going on with unemployment. So today we'll talk about the labor market. As I said, we are going to revisit unemployment one more time and then we will talk about crisis. We will talk about the Great Depression, the global financial crisis of 2007-2009, and then I will also talk to you about the Greek debt crisis, which is a very different crisis than, uh, than the other two, and you can have some context of what happens with the crisis. And then uh, I want to refer to two specific topics based on the theory that we know already, stagflation and the liquidity trap, and then finally we are going to close today's lecture and unfortunately the whole course with international trade. So I will tell you a few uh, key things that you need to know about international trade and this part of the lecture will be, I think, the, the easiest uh, for today. So let's get started with the labor market. In order to understand how unemployment is determined, first you have to understand how the labor market works. It is very important to understand that the labor market connects to the rest of the economy through production. You cannot produce without the most basic production factor, that is labor. So labor is connected with the commodity market, but is also connected with other markets through various links that we will not spend a lot of time analyzing today. But if you want to understand at least how unemployment works, first you have to understand how the labor market works. So in the labor market, households supply the labor and firms demand it. So households are now the sellers and then firms are the buyers of labor services. So we have a reverse of roles here from what we had seen in the microeconomic part of the course where the households were the buyers and the firms were the sellers. Here we have the reverse. So the households are selling their labor hours and the firms are buying them. Okay, so we have a reverse of roles. We will explore the labor demand curve and the labor supply curve separately 
since we have a labor supply curve here, this will be a hint to you that the market of labor that we will talk about is a market where labor is actually transacted in a perfectly competitive manner. So we have many sellers and many buyers. We do not assume that any of the two parties here have market power. Later, we will relax for a brief amount of time this assumption, but for most of the of this today's discussion, we will consider that nobody has any special power here. So then once we analyze the labor demand and the labor supply, we're going to put them together and we will describe what happens at the equilibrium. But heads up here, because after we establish equilibrium in most of the other markets, we are home free, we are done. In the labor market, once we establish the equilibrium, then that is when our job begins. Because there are some strange things that happen with the equilibrium of the labor market. Let's see them. Let's start with the demand for labor. Firms demand the quantity of labor which maximizes their profit. Okay, so firms are driven in their decisions from profit maximization. So they will decide how many workers they will hire, how many labor they will demand, given to the profit maximization condition. So this will occur, profit will be maximum, when the value of the marginal product of labor will be equal to the marginal cost of labor. So again, we have here the marginal revenue kind of connected to the marginal cost. All right, so we have the, the value of the marginal product of labor. So we are talking about how much each worker contributes to production. What is each worker's addition to the value of production? All right, and this has to become equal to the marginal cost of labor. Let's see how this uh, exactly works. A worker would be hired if his or her contribution to the firm's revenues is at least equal to the cost that firm incurs in order to employ this particular worker. In other words, if you can bring me revenues higher than your salary, I should hire you because I will be making money from you. You will have a positive contribution to my profit. All right, so the value of marginal product of labor, however, is progressively diminishing, meaning that as I keep hiring workers, each worker that I am hiring would have a smaller and smaller and smaller contribution to labor because after you hire a basic number of workers, a basic amount of, of labor hours, then the extra hours will have a smaller and smaller and smaller addition to the firm's revenue. All right, so each added worker is naturally less and less valuable to the firm's operation after some point. So in perfectly competitive labor markets, the marginal cost of labor will be the wage rate W. So we'll denote the wage rate with W. This is the uh, amount that we have to pay our labor, our workers per unit of work, maybe per, per work hour, maybe per worker, depending on what you consider quantity of labor there. So in perfectly competitive markets, the marginal cost of labor will be the wage rate W. All right, so wage will be defined at an industry level and each individual worker will be a price taker. Later, we assume that, that workers unionize and they can actually implement a higher wage rate, negotiate a higher wage rate, but for this moment here, we will assume that you're just a price taker, there is a given wage, and this has been determined in the labor market, and then you just have to take this wage, which is not an assumption that is far away from the truth. In most of the cases, very, very few workers from the labor force, they have the ability to negotiate uh, wages that they are much higher than the, the market rate. So a firm would keep hiring workers until the point that the value of the marginal product of labor, VMPL, would be equal to the wage, which is nothing different than this equality that we have up there. All right, so let's see 
a brief example of the optimal demand of labor decision. Assume that the wage rate is $80 per day. So we have a wage rate that is $80 per day. So here, our quantity of labor is workers per day. All right, so one unit of labor is one worker for one day. Uh, capital is fixed, so you have no uh, machinery that will play a role here in production. We are in the short term period. Capital is fixed. The only thing you can adjust is labor, if you remember what we said in the first couple of lectures. And the first worker contributes by producing $200 worth of product per day. So here, I should decide if I will hire this worker or if I will not hire this worker. Now, since this guy gives me $200 and what he asks for me is $80, that sounds like a pretty good deal, so hired. The second worker now contributes less because he's not as valuable as the first one. The first one was vital. The second one is a little less uh, uh, valuable for me. So the second worker contributes by producing $130 worth of output per day. Still, he gives me 130, I give him 80, sounds again like a good deal, so I will hire this person also. The third worker contributes now by producing $100 worth of output per day, again exceeds the wage, I will hire this person too. The fourth worker contributes by producing a little less, again, naturally the contribution goes down. So $90 worth of output per day. This means that he allows me to earn $10 by hiring him, so I will hire this person as well. The fifth worker contributes by producing $50 worth of product per day. Now, I have to pay this person for $80. It's not this person's fault that they contribute only $50. It's not that they are worse workers than the previous ones. It's that I already have four people and the fifth person here is not going to be as valuable as the other, the other four. Okay, so the fifth worker contributes by producing $50 worth of product per day. So unfortunately, I cannot hire this person. I could hire this person if the wage rate would go below $50. So if the wage rate was 150, then I could not even hire the second worker here. I would stay with only one worker. If the wage rate was 110, then I could hire the first worker. I could hire the second worker, but I could not afford to hire the third worker. So I would hire only two workers. Uh, if the wage rate was how much the firm would hire three workers. All right, so that's a, a good question here. If I would hire the third worker, it means that the wage rate should be below $100. And if I cannot hire the fourth one, I will stop at the third. It means that it should be above $90. So it should be between $90 and $100, let me say $95. So if the wage rate was $95, the firm would hire just three workers. All right, so what we can see from here is that this is a very well-behaving demand curve. The firm's demand for labor is negatively related to the wage rate. So the demand of labor is a negative relationship between the wage rate and the quantity of labor hours, the number of workers or work hours demanded. So let's put this together in a graph. This would be a typical demand curve for labor. We assume that this shows us the relationship between the quantity of labor that we have in the horizontal axis in the same way that we have any demand curve. In the horizontal axis, we have the quantity that is demanded. And then in the vertical axis, we always put the price. Here, the price of labor is the wage rate. So this is a normal, well-defined demand curve that does not really have many differences from the demands of simple products. Now, anything that will affect the relationship between the value of the marginal product of labor and the wage rate will 
should be expected to shift the labor demand. All right, so we should expect here that anything that will affect the underlying relationship VMPL equals W will make this curve to shift. Now, before we start trying to find out which are the shifters for the labor demand, let us first make sure that we understand what doesn't shift the labor demand. So when I want to see what doesn't shift the labor demand, I should check, first of all, the axis of my demand curve. Whatever is on the axis, W, for example, and L that they are here, they are not demand shifters or supply shifters when we will have the supply curve for labor later. All right, so what does not change the demand for Coca-Cola? The price of Coca-Cola. What does, what does not change the demand for labor? The price of labor. All right, W will not be a shifter in the same way that L is not going to be a shifter neither. So output price is the first shifter when the price of output increases. If my product becomes more expensive, this means that my workers who make this product have their contribution increased because what they are making now, it's more expensive. So VMPL will increase if the prices go up. So when the price of output increases, the value of the marginal product of labor will increase, and therefore firms would like to hire more L at every W. This will make the curve to shift in a position like DL1 here. All right, the second is the price of capital. When the cost of capital increases, so when capital costs more, the firms will tend to substitute capital with workers. All right, so for example, if we see that the price of printers goes up, instead of having three printers and one worker to work on the three printers, I will maybe want to have only one printer and hire three workers that they will work in shifts. All right, so when the cost of capital increases, firms tend to substitute capital with labor and the labor demand increases. And finally, technology. Technology, as a matter of fact, increases the productivity of workers. Like, for example, I would work much more effectively if I have a computer than if I have no computer. I will work much more effectively if I have a projector that will uh, shoot PowerPoint slides than if I had an overhead projector that would actually just take transparencies like they had in the old times. So it makes you more productive as a worker if you have better technology. Now, what do firms want to do if labor productivity increases? Here, the result will be ambiguous. In some particular production processes, they would like to hire more workers. In some other production processes, they would prefer to hire less workers. So in other words, in some production processes, if the productivity of labor goes up, then the firm will be like, oh, this means I can do my job with less workers now since the productivity of each worker has gone up. So for example, that would be the case in banking. Once computers make banking much, much easier, or now we have, for example, one person that can do a thousand transactions per hour because this person does not anymore sit and service its customer behind the counter every day, but sits behind the computer and just overlooks how the online system of the bank works. So this uh, bank, most likely they will, ha they will fire several tellers at the, at the cashiers or cashiers in order to uh, reduce their cost. So in this case, what we will see is that Productivity of labor will be negatively related with the amount of labor that you want to buy. So it will decrease the demand of labor. In some other particular processes, you might have the opposite. Once workers become more productive, you might want to hire more because your profits will go up this way.
Let's now see how the labor supply is determined. Labor supply is the relationship between quantity of labor supplied by households and the wage rate. Households decide how much labor they will supply according to the level that maximizes their utility. Now, the problem is that households allocate their time between work and leisure. This means that households have two sources of utility. The first source of utility is utility that you receive from labor income. This increases with your labor supply. If you supply more hours, then this means that you will have more income from labor. But on the other hand, leisure utility comes from the hours of leisure that you have. If you work more, you will receive less hours of leisure, and therefore the utility from leisure will be smaller. So households have to pick, to balance these two utilities, utility from leisure and utility from income, and they will have to hit the optimum allocation of work hours in order to maximize their utility. So in general, at a macroeconomic level, as the wage rises, workers will be expected to supply more and more quantity of labor. If you have taken classes of economics before, perhaps you have seen some strange supply curves for labor. That is, for low wage rates, as the wage rate increases, households supply more and more labor hours. But at some point, when the wage rate becomes sufficiently high, households will start decreasing their supply of labor for higher wage rates than that. How does this work? Imagine, for example, that I am offered a job that will pay me $10 an hour. In this case, I will make a decision, let's say, to work for six hours a day. The pay is not that high. I will just dedicate six hours a day to that. If they increase the wage to $20 an hour, I will probably say, let me do now eight hours. If they increase it into $30 an hour, I may want to do 10 hours a day. If they increase it to $1,000 an hour, I will probably want to do 12 hours because now the money is a lot and I receive a lot of income from that. So if they increase it to $10,000 an hour, then I will top my labor uh, supply, I will go to, let's say, 16 hours a day. So I will work all day and I will just sleep for some time until I have a lot, lot, lot of money to buy whatever I have to buy. Okay, so in this case, if the salary, the wage keeps increasing even more, now they give me a million an hour, I will be like, oh, wait a second. This means that if I work 16 hours a day, I will make 16 million a day. So let me just decrease a little bit my, my labor time because now I don't want to just work and sleep. Now I want to have some time to be able to enjoy my, my high income. So I will probably shift my uh, work hours down to, let's say, six hours again now. So you keep increasing your labor supply till you hit some specific wage rate at which the opportunity cost of labor, which is the leisure that you're losing, becomes too important for you. And then you turn your behavior the opposite way and you start decreasing your labor supply as the wage rate goes up after this extremely high, let's say, uh, wage rate that you are offered. But in a macroeconomic level, we don't see this happening because at the point that I will start decreasing my labor supply, somebody else will hit the market and will be able, no, I want to offer work hours to substitute for the, for the work hours that you are losing from Cosmos, not want to work anymore. So on aggregate, we are not seeing this turning back of the supply curve. So we suppose that supply curve of labor will be something like that it will become at some point totally vertical. This is the point that we call the maximum capacity of the economy. In other words, all the population, everybody who can work, 
who money is the reason if they will make a decision to join the labor force or not, then these, all these people, they will work at L, upper bar. In this case, it's the natural maximum of labor that can be supplied by an economy given its population. It's, it's population that can be expected to work at some particular wage rate. So we see here that when the wage rate makes it some point here, then everybody will want to work. If the wage rate is down here, then these people here, they will decide to not be on the labor force, etc. So this is exactly how this curve works. It, you have an increasing relationship, a positive relationship between L and W up to some wage rate. After this wage rate, everybody joins the labor force. That's it. Naturally, it's not possible to increase it even further after that. Now, what shifts the labor supply? Let's see here three major factors that cause the entire labor supply curve to shift. First of all is tastes. Changing of tastes or social norms. This affects people's willingness to, to take a paid job. So, for example, you decide that it's time for you to start working, and then in this case, you can, you can just do it. So it, it has to do with, with taste in the society, preferences of households, depending on how they consider their quality of life, if they need more leisure or if they need more income. Now, social norms is something that is very important. We saw a very rapid increase in the 1920s and 30s from the, uh, in the labor force from women joining the labor force. Before that, we had women to just stay at home and very few women would offer uh, work. And then uh, somebody would expect that um, uh, this would uh, come to a point that at some point, we will have equality between men and women, and then women will decide that it's their right to go and work. And uh, this uh, situation was not at all like that. Before the 1920s, a lot of women that they were very capable of working, of getting uh, jobs many times better than their husbands, uh, they would not join the labor force, not because they didn't want or not because they couldn't offer the services, but because their husbands, they just didn't let them uh, work. And we should expect that at some point the society will understand how wrong that was and men will be like, okay, listen, that's enough, that's horrible. Some women are very, very... Uh, particularly capable of doing jobs much, much better than any man can do. So we should allow all women to just join the labor force and compete with men in taking the job positions that they deserve. So this should be the expected. However, it didn't happen like that. There was not a moment of realization that men said, what is happening is wrong we should allow everybody to have equal chances in the labor market. Uh, what happened was the war. So in the first and uh, in the second world war, but particularly in the first, men had to go to war, especially in the United States, and then there was nobody to do this job. So women had a very good excuse into sneaking into the, into the labor market in this, in this particular case. So they sneaked in and they got jobs, they prove the value and they are uh, doing super well. And then at some point the troops come back and they have to get back their jobs. And then women are like, maybe honey, should we stay and have like a, a both of us have income and I should also work. I'm already working. See, that's not that bad. It doesn't make you seem as a worse person. And that's how women, they actually made it to the labor force. It, it was not, unfortunately, a moment that we said, oh, that was a mistake. Please, we are sorry. Let's fix things. It didn't happen like that. We had to have the war so women would sneak in the labor market. So we saw that when this happened, we had a huge increase in the uh, supply of labor in this case. A second shifter of the labor supply is the opportunity cost of time. The invention of devices like vacuum cleaners, dishwashers, laundry machines, 
it actually lowered the opportunity cost of working outside the home and freed up time that before was dedicated to home production. You need to work, you need the income from supplying labor, but you also need to have food at home, to have clean clothes, to have a clean house and all these things that they need to be done at home. And before the invention of those machines, you should have one member of the family that they will dedicate an entire day in home production. Also, population is another shifter, increases the supply of uh, labor can happen from increase in population. Uh, examples of that is immigration, shift of the labor supply curve to the right, including its vertical portion, because now you have more people, so the capacity of the economy will also increase to L2 upper bar, meaning that as Im immigration increases, we see increase in the population of workers, and this increased population of workers is supposed to increase the maximum capacity of the economy from L upper bar to L2 upper bar. All right, now, what happens with the equilibrium in a perfectly competitive labor market? This will be at the point of intersection of the labor supply and labor demand. So this is our graph, this is the labor supply, this is the labor demand, and in this case, they would intersect at point A, where we have the equilibrium quantity of labor L star and the equilibrium wage W star. The equilibrium wage W star is usually referred to as the market clearing wage. Every worker that wants a job can actually find one at W star. So W star is a wage rate that once it prevails in the market, it makes the amount of those who want a job equal to the amount of those who want to hire workers. All right, so the amount of, of job positions. So at W star, we have every worker that wants a job can eventually find one. Now, in every economy, we observe that there is some unemployment rate. There's no economy that doesn't have unemployment, that unemployment rate would be zero. Question is, once you have a well-behaved labor market and you have the demand of labor to be like this curve DL that we have here, and the supply of labor to be like this purple curve that we have in the graph SL, so those two curves, they just intersect at A. At A, we define a market wage that is equating the supply of labor with the demand of labor. So everybody who wants a job, they find the job. The question is, where is the unemployment once the economy is at A? Somebody can say that the unemployment would be from A up to meeting the, uh, the vertical line of L upper bar. This is not the unemployment rate. The reason that this is not the unemployment in this economy is because at this wage rate, W star, not L upper bar people want to get a job. Only L star people want to get a job. So L star from L upper bar at a wage rate W star, they're just dropping out of the labor force. They are not part of the labor force. And we said in lecture 10 that we define unemployment as the amount of unemployed workers over the labor force. Now, if this is not in the labor force, it will not be in the unemployment. So what happens with unemployment here? Where is my unemployment? So let's revisit unemployment one more time and see what is going on and how unemployment is connected to the labor market. All right, so uh, here's a very, very interesting picture back from the Great Depression that we will speak about it a little later today. 
jobless men keep going. We can't take care of our own chamber of commerce. So probably chamber of commerce back in the U.S. in the Great Depression did not have a very good PR person. If you would post a message uh, like that today, that would be not very good advertisement for you. But then we are living in very strange times. Uh, we will talk also about that a little later today. So you could expect everything. Sometimes the history just does circles. I hope we will never get to that point again. But you can never be sure. So let's see what is going on. Unemployment revisited. At the market clearing uh, wage, supply and demand of labor are equal. Everybody who wants to find a job does have one. This is, in other words, a definition of zero unemployment. You do not have any unemployment at A. Unemployment is zero at A. However, in reality, this is not uh, like that. This conventional supply-demand analysis does not depict well what is happening with the unemployment problem. We have to make additional assumptions in order for this to work. So unemployment exists more or less in every economy. Greece right now has an unemployment rate 23%. Singapore had an unemployment rate two, three months ago that was around 2%. United States lowest than ever, 3.6%, and etc. You see that unemployment level more or less exists around the world. There is no unemployment of zero in anywhere, uh, any location, anywhere in the world. So there are two different partitions for unemployment. And I want to clear something that from teaching this course uh, many previous times, I have realized that a lot of students confuse. There are two different separate partitions for unemployment. There is one partition that separates unemployment, categorizes it to frictional and structural unemployment. And this is a distinction that has to do with the function of the labor market how the labor market as institution works and yields this unemployment. Okay, so the first distinction between unemployment uh, uh, kinds is frictional and structural. That's a one taxonomy. There is a second taxonomy which is alternative to the first. And what is splits, uh, what is this is that it splits unemployment between natural and cyclical unemployment. This distinction has to do with the state of the economy. If they, the, the short-run fluctuation that the economy is at that point, at that time. All right. So natural and cyclical, they have to do with the state of the economy. Frictional and structural, they have to do with the function of the labor market as an institution. What is happening in the labor market in general, in the long run? So let's start... Uh, checking the first taxonomy, frictional versus structural unemployment, how this work, the conventional supply and demand analysis assumes that any worker that wants to be employed at W star can do so. If more workers come in, then we should be expected to see uh, uh, the wage rate to decrease. And in this case, we will never have a surplus of labor because, in other words, unemployment would be a surplus of quantity of work hours in the market because it's supplied too much and it's demanded less. So this is what unemployment should, should be. Now, uh, finding the right job is not simple and may take time. So in reality, as I told you in lecture 10, you should not expect that you are losing your job today at 6 o'clock in the evening and tomorrow morning you will be able to work at another job after you found it just in a few hours. So this is not the case in the vast majority of situations of unemployment. From updating your CV, which is what signifies you joining the market for finding a new job, that's the first thing you do when you lose your job, when you quit your job, you just go and you update your CV. So from updating your CV till reporting for work in your first day of work, it may take at minimum three weeks. That's the best case of reasonable scenario. 
Uh, sometimes it takes several months. Depending on the unemployment rate of the economy, it may take, in some cases, many months, or in some other cases, even years to find a suitable job. So it takes time to find a job. We call these search frictions, and such search frictions arise for two main reasons. The first is that there are time-consuming logistics for finding, applying, or interviewing for jobs. These all take time. Like, for example, every company will run 10, 15, sometimes 30 interviews. If you are the first person that you will take an interview there, the company will not be like, oh, it's okay, you work for us, uh, you're hired. They're not going to be like that. They are going to tell you, okay, we'll let you know. This means that you have to wait till the interview sessions will finish for everybody. This might take weeks. Then they will have a meeting. They will discuss the applicants. They are going to make offers. They will give you some time to answer in the offer. If you are not the first in line, but you are the second, third, you have to wait till the other people think about it and they will reject the offer. So the offer will come to you, etc. So this might take time. For the company, also this will be the case. Once you put an advertisement for a new position, you have to wait for some time till you start seeing people. So you give time to everybody to, to, to join uh, the search. And you should also allow uh, for screening. You should allow for initial interviews, then second uh, uh, term of interviews. And you have a lot of time that goes uh, uh, for logistics and uh, finding, applying, and interviewing. The second important friction is that you have imperfect information. Like, for example, you do not know what is the quality of the worker and you do not know what is the quality of the position. So I know what kind of job I'm offering. The applicant knows what kind of worker they are, but the other party always ignores the information that you know. So we have to go through screening, you have to go through initial interview, second interview, third interview. Uh, in some cases, the big four firms, for what I know, they will might need up to nine rounds of interviews and examinations and meetings with the applicants in order to hire somebody. Okay, even for entry positions and mainly for entry positions, they take a lot of time before they decide. And this is because they want to resolve this imperfect information. So they will give you several tests. They will give you several uh, uh, interviews. They want you to meet many different members of the, of the company that will, uh, that will employ you. And then they decide at, in this basis if you are suitable or not. And also this will take time. So these are the two main frictions that we have. Frictions do not create permanently unemployed workers. So nobody will stay unemployed forever just because of frictions. Frictions are just frictions. They will become better with time. In some economies, those frictions are very, very time consuming. In some other economies, they are not that time consuming. And this has to do with the state of the labor market. Like, for example, in the past, you had to mail in your CV. If you wanted to uh, be hired, when I, when I first joined the market uh, in 2008 and I was looking for a job, uh, just in the middle of the crisis, actually. So in this case, most of the universities, they would accept to make electronic applications, but some of the universities, they would require that you will mail in hard copies of your all your materials and application. This meant that in order to send all your materials to, to a university, you, sh you should send a, a, a thick like that envelope to every university and arrange with all your referees to send reference, your reference letters to the university directly. It was a logistic nightmare in this case. All right, so uh, it would take a lot of time even for the post to just deliver these physical envelopes to them, to them, somebody to open them, to classify them, to, to screen them and everything. So this would take a lot of time. So even in this case, you had frictions that at some point they would decide 
to hire somebody so they will start from next August to, uh, to teach at that university. Now, it happens totally electronically. Actually, you don't even email it. You go in a platform and you, f- you put in your material once and then you decide to which universities you are going to send what kind of materials that you want to send as an applicant. And in this case, the frictions have gone down but still take some time. So, depending on how the economy operates, the frictions can be small, can be big, but they will be resolved at some point and you will get a job. So uh, frictions will not be the reason for permanent unemployment, but they do inflate the unemployment rate since they lengthen the time a worker spends between jobs. Structural unemployment, on the other hand, is not temporary. It occurs when the labor market cannot equilibrate due to some particular structure issue of the labor market as an institution. That is, the function of the labor market prevents the wage from falling to the market clearing level. So now we have some kind of constraint that does not allow the wage to go to the equilibrium level. That's the actual problem like that. So you have your market as we know it, the equilibrium is right there, we can see where the equilibrium is, but for some reason, the wage stacks at some other point different than the equilibrium. So here we have a wage Y prime, and this wage is not the equilibrium wage, is higher than the equilibrium wage. This means that you will have unemployment because the demand of labor will be at point B, L, D, and the supply of labor would be at C. Supply exceeds the demand of labor, therefore you will have unemployment B, C there. So the quantity of labor supplied exceeds the quantity of labor demanded causing unemployment. All right, so this is the reason why we have unemployment. Not because the graph cannot show us unemployment, but because we cannot go to the point that the labor demand and the labor supply will be equal to L star, and this is point A. So point A cannot be achieved here just because of something that keeps the wage rate up there. Now, this wage rigidity may happen for several reasons in the economy. So the wage rigidity is a structural problem, so creates structural employment, and can happen for several reasons. Before I explain the reasons, I want you to make sure that you understand that now we are talking about structural unemployment, and structural unemployment is the unemployment between points B and C, the amount of workers that they don't get jobs between B and C. And this is because the equilibrium wage cannot be achieved because the actual wage in the market is stuck at W prime. There are four reasons why might this happen, why the wage is not allowed to fall to W star, but instead remains stuck at W prime. So what are these reasons? Minimum wage legislation, labor unions, efficiency wages, or downward wage aversion. Let's examine each one of them. I will keep this graph there so you will be remembering what we're talking about. Again, we're talking about the reasons that they do not allow the actual wage to fall down to the equilibrium wage to the market clearing wage. The first reason is legislation. In most countries there are laws that they specify a minimum level for the hourly uh, wage, so we call this the minimum wage. So this is legislation that exists in uh, I would say 80-85% of the countries. Singapore does not have a minimum wage because the situation in Singapore is a little different than other economies. Again, one more time, Singapore is a very manageable economy in size and, and, and also in, in its function. And therefore, 
so far there was no need to have a minimum wage. However, in most countries there is such a law. You cannot pay any worker for anything lower than uh, this wage. If the minimum wage here is W prime, this might be the reason why you cannot go down here to W star because it's just not legal to give a salary below W prime. So one of the explanations why W prime is implemented in this market is because of the minimum wage. If the legislative wage floor is above the market clearing wage, therefore, workers in EB get jobs at the wage above W star. So these are the workers that benefit from the minimum wage, but then there are some other workers between B and C, and these workers cannot find a job. They will be unemployed because the wage rate is not allowed to go to the equilibrium level W star. So this labor market will go to point A. Minimum wage laws is an example of a policy that creates winners and losers. And we clearly see here that there is a red part of the graph and a green part of the graph, meaning that these people in the green part, they are better off because they're receiving a wage W prime instead a wage W star. And then there are some other workers in the red segment there, which they are not even able to have W star. They have zero wage because just they cannot find any job at all. This is a controversial issue because we see that in some cases, it's not as simple as to say, why should we give a better wage to some people and then the other ones are sacrificed in order for us to be able to do that? Okay, why do we say that let's have some workers to benefit and some workers to lose. Imagine that W star is way lower than W prime and W star does not give you a decent chance to be able to survive in a way that uh, will be above the poverty level. In this case, if the equilibrium in the market is below the poverty level, then you don't want to go to the equilibrium and you want to go above the equilibrium. This means that you keep a big part of your workers above the poverty level, but then these other guys here, they cannot find any job. So then they do not just poverty, they do exactly zero. They become homeless or I don't know what. So in this case, there are winners, there are losers. This will be in the political debate all the time. Uh, right now in the United States, they again discuss about a minimum wage. In some cases, they discuss even about a minimum guaranteed income. This is what the Democrats have all already uh, proposed, and we will see how this will go. But in the future elections of 2020, in the debate between the two candidates, we will see extended discussions about the minimum wage because this is a very controversial issue. The second reason for why you might have W prime to be the wage, the prevailing wage, instead of W star, is labor unions and collective bargaining. So collective contract negotiation between firms and labor unions can give market power to the workers. So workers, they negotiate the salaries all together. That is, they actually collude all together and they fix the price at a level that maximizes their own benefit. So in this case, we will have the wage rate to be above the equilibrium wage in the market just because work, labor unions can do that. Labor unions are organizations of workers that they advocate for better conditions, pay, and benefits for their members, but their basic role in the economy is to negotiate as uh, in one entity the wages. This is how it affects our model like that. Most of the times they, they advocate for better conditions and for benefits and for everything else, but in general here 
we uh, consider their role as negotiators. Now, the situation with the labor unions is not as clear. First of all, we have to say that from the beginning of, of 50s and 60s, and even in the 70s, the labor union uh, movement was what actually allowed the creation of the middle class in countries like the United States, England, Western Europe uh, in general allowed the workers to be able to make decent salaries that they could have a decent middle class life with uh, their hard work. So this was one of the good things. But after the 80s, we saw a lot of corruption of the labor unions. Labor unions had a lot of power, political power for their leaders. And then this created a lot of corruption. And at some point, you would see that the labor unions would actually drag the whole economy down. This was a particular example in Southern Europe. In Southern Europe, labor unions got a lot of power and at some point they will negotiate wages that they could not be uh, justified with the increase in productivity of these workers. Like, for example, in Spain, like, for example, in Italy, like, for example, in Greece, you would have labor unions to go on endless strikes in order to be able to achieve higher wages. And these were wages that they were way above the increase in productivity for these workers. So this created a lot of rigidity problem in the economy, created uh, unemployment because unions were threatening to strike every time as a bargaining chip in negotiations. This was something that created high unemployment and brings us to the point to say why there was this corruption because if you were a member of the union, then you were in the part of the labor force that had a job. If you were not part of the labor union, you were there. So the labor unions, they did care about their members, but they didn't care about those who were not in the labor union. And this was something that created, again, winners and losers and became much more intensified in the 80s and 90s. Today, labor unions in the Western countries are not very relevant. Uh, it's it's uh, not very usual that you will have an active labor union uh, when you have a job in the United States anymore. In specific professions, they do have labor unions, but the labor unions there, they just like watchdogs for particular situations rather than to be able to do what they were doing back in the 80s and 90s. So collective bargaining leads to higher wages than individual negotiation. This is because by getting together, you collude with other workers and you uh, are able to have some market power in which case you uh, makes you able to negotiate better uh, salary. This creates, of course, winners and losers, similar exactly to the minimum wage. So if you go back to the previous slide, you will see that the the green area and the red area here uh, will be exactly the same. It's the same graph. Just now the reason for why you you stay here and you don't go down there is different. Okay, in the previous slide, the reason was that Uh, you had the minimum wage in this slide is because you have labor unions that they do not allow the wage to go down. A third reason is efficiency wages. Many firms voluntarily want to pay their workers more. So they want to pay uh, W prime instead of W star. So many employers, they say, I want to pay my workers well because I expect something in exchange from them. I know that the equilibrium equilibrium rate is W star, but we pay higher than competition. We pay better than competition. If you pay better than competition, you increase the productivity and profitability for a number of reasons. First of all, you reduce costly worker turnover, meaning that if you're paying well, your workers will not be leaving you. Uh, When I was in Russia, I had a lot of friends and at some point I had a lot of students that they had graduated and they have gotten good jobs and they were working crazy hours. Both of my friends, both my friends and my uh, past students, they would tell me that they would work days of 12 or 14 hours routinely. And when I told them, why don't you get 
another job where they will respect your time much better. They said, well, it's not that. They do make us work much harder hours, but the pay is way better than the competition. And this was what made them tolerate that. In other cases, however, because Russia was an, a country that had particularly low unemployment at positions of work that they were slightly specialized, like uh, for workers that they are not entry level uh, for, for simple jobs, but they were qualified workers. So for qualified workers, you would see very, very usually from other friends that I had that they would change employers almost every three to six months. So you meet your friend, you're like, hey, how's it going? How's work? Oh, I changed job. And then you meet them after three, four months again. And then they will be like, oh, I changed work once again, twice in this period. So you would have a lot of high turnover in these cases. If you pay your workers well, then in this case, you should expect to reduce costly worker turnover. It is costly because it costs for the company to be able to hire another worker, meaning that the worker in the beginning will not be very productive and you will go through a process of hiring them and a process of training them. So if you pay well, you avoid that. The fear of losing a high paying job motivates employees. So employees are getting paid well. They don't want to lose such a good job. So they give their best in order to be able to produce well and for the employer to not complain or ever firing them. Third, it makes employees grateful for high wages, leading them to reciprocate by working harder. And this is something that uh, uh, actually works very well. You see companies that they pay well and they give a lot of benefits to their employees, that they do have higher productivity than Uh, companies that they do not pay well and they they try to uh, save the last penny regarding with how they pay their workers. So you see that uh, uh, employees, they do show appreciation for a company that treats them well and they behave much better. SMU is a a efficiency wage uh, employer. Actually, SMU pays uh, way better than most competitive universities at a world level. And when I'm saying much better, I mean at least 25 to 30% better for equivalent positions at other universities. Given that Singapore is also a very nice place to live, this is not a premium. Like for example, when I was in Russia, they would pay better, but they would pay better because you were living in an environment that you had minus 25 degrees Celsius for six months every year, so they would pay a little more because nobody would voluntarily want to do that. Okay, but in Singapore, that's not the case. The reason that they pay higher is because they expect from their employees to do their best and to do a little bit more every time that they have a challenge to do a little bit more than what they required. For example, if there is a call for transferring the classes online, Uh, Instead of sitting in front of a computer and reading the slides, they may go through the trouble to just set up four cameras and being able to deliver the lecture in the best possible way that they think that the students will appreciate. So this happens because if the employee is satisfied from their job, they will do their best also for the employer and the employer will have a return for that. So efficiency wages urge more workers to join the labor force, however, and this makes unemployment to appear higher. Let's try to understand what what we're talking about here. So the reason why we stay at W prime and not go to W star is because these employers say that I know that the equilibrium wage is W star, but I want to pay my workers better W prime. If you do that, Uh, you pay your workers much higher than the equilibrium. This means that not only these workers will actually uh, be in the labor market. Now you have other workers that for W star, they would not work. But since the, the wage increases to W prime, these guys here, they would want to be a part of the labor force. So I don't work at W star, but... If you give me W prime, oh yes, I want to work. So efficiency wages, they urge AC people, 
those guys, they urge them to enter the labor market and they add to the amount of workers that they cannot find work because now, in this case, uh, the company prefers to employ LD workers at a higher wage than to employ L star workers at that wage right here. So efficiency wages, they do lead to unemployment, both because they do not allow the LD to L star workers to have a job because of the higher wage, but also because they urge L star to LS here to join uh, to join the labor market while at the normal equilibrium wage rate, they would not want to enter. Another reason for why the wage might be prevented from going from W prime to W star is downward wage aversion. Downward wage aversion is slightly different, especially as far as the graph is concerned. Slightly different, not much different. So let's see exactly what's going on. Workers do not like when their boss offers them to work the same amount of hours but for less pay. This is expected to hurt worker morale and to reduce productivity. This is a natural thing to expect in any economy. Uh, it happened to me very uh, recently. I was in Greece back in October and I needed to receive a certificate from uh, a public service. And uh, I went to the employee, I had everything that they needed uh, prepared, and I went to the employee, I filed my application, and I uh, asked this person kindly to uh, make the certificate for a specific use that I needed it for. So we had the discussion, he said, of course, he will do it, he understood exactly what I wanted, and then I filed my, my application, and I left, and a few days later, I received the certificate in the mail. And, of course, the certificate was not what I asked. So I was intended to take the certificate and go back to him and ask him to redo it because this was not what I asked and everything. And uh, the day that I was going, my uh, I had a discussion with my mother in the morning and she told me, oh, be very careful with them now because they announced a few days ago that they will reduce their salaries even more because of the crisis. And uh, uh, they are not going to be to the best of moods. So be careful what you ask them, just be very diplomatic and everything. Uh, it's not in my character, as you have understood so far, to be very diplomatic. So I went there and I simply told the guy that, uh, you know, this certificate was not what we discussed. I explained to you what, you what I wanted and what you have to do. And you didn't do that. You did the thing that you do all the time. Now you have to redo it. And uh, uh, when should I take it? So the guy looks at the certificate and is like, no, that's exactly works for what you want. But that's not what we said. We said we had a very different discussion. And you said this. Uh, yes, but now I cannot do it again. Listen, listen, uh, send it there. And if they don't accept it, I'll do it again. I'm like, I cannot do that because time is very sensitive for me. I live abroad. And if I file the application and it's rejected, I have to come to Greece again in order to do it. Please do it. So the guy gets very angry. He's like, you know what? I'm making 800 euros a month and you asked for me services that they are five-star services. You know what? I cannot offer these services to you. So he gets up. He kicks me out of the office. He gets out of the office. He locks the door and he's like, you know what? For 800 euros, I don't want to work anymore. You know what? I'm going home. And he left. He locked the office and he left and he went home. And the time was on a Thursday at one o'clock in the evening. So the guy was like, you know what? That I don't want to do this for 800 euros a month. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And he left. This is something that an employee that is getting paid well is not going to do. So these guys, they didn't really like it that they reduced their salary and this had a result in their productivity. Uh, uh, by the way, I went there another day. I took a box of chocolates. I tried to do my best. Finally, I got another certificate and I did my job. But just the message is that if they reduce your salary, uh, 
there is no much you can do. It's a natural behavior to, to not to want to work that, uh, that hard anymore. So assume that wage is as W uh, star not here. So we are in a, an equilibrium situation and we have no unemployment. Until at some point, for some external reason, labor demand falls at D1. L. So we have the labor demand here to become worse just because firms expect a recession or something like that, and they decrease their uh, demand of labor. So now the market should equilibrate at B, at the lower salary. Uh, firms could just fire employees from L0 to L1. So these employees here, they should be fired. And once you do that, they will have the wage rate to equilibrate at W1 star, at which point only L1 star workers will be working. Again, at this point, we have no unemployment at B because those workers that they will drop out of the market are these workers here now that for wages above W1 star, they want to work, but at wage W1 star, they, it's not worth it for them to work anymore. So in this case, these guys voluntarily, they drop out of the labor force. So this amount of people that they are fired here, they uh, are not actually unemployed. Uh, they voluntarily drop out of the labor force because the salary is too low for them to offer labor services anymore. So in other words, we can say here that this is not an amount of workers that they would be fired. In an alternative explanation, you can say that once the wage falls from W not star to W one star, these guys here, uh, they don't want to work anymore because the wage is too low for them. So they will drop out of the labor force. This would be the case if the wage is allowed to fall to uh, W1 star. However, firms by themselves, here there is no efficiency wage, there is minimum, there is no minimum wage laws, there is no labor unions, there is nothing of the previous things. Here, the only thing that will make this situation to not happen is that instead Firms will prefer to keep the wage at W not star. They will prefer to keep it there because they don't want to go to the workers and decrease their salaries. So they want to keep the salary constant, but now they will actually have all these people from L2 to L0, they will have them fired. So this means that instead of lowering the wage and go to point B, at which there is no unemployment, I would prefer to go to point C, which is not an equilibrium uh, point. We have a surplus of labor there, which is what we call unemployment, and this will cause unemployment level equal to L0 star minus L2, and unemployment can be measured from point uh, C to point 8 right there. So wage W0 star exceeds the market clearing wage W1 star. This is exactly uh, similar to the discussion that we had before. Here we had W prime and here we had W star. Here uh, you don't want to go to, to this new equilibrium. You had an old and a new equilibrium here. You don't want to go to the new equilibrium just because it would be difficult to convince your workers to accept lower salaries. So usually, only when a firm is in the brink of bankruptcy will have a discussion with a union of workers or the representatives of the workers and they will try to convince them to take uh, uh, decreased salaries or else they would close. And this has happened several in several cases that uh, some particular businesses, they are not doing well. And then the firms, they have discussion with the workers to accept lower salaries uh, or else they will go out of business. And then because workers, they don't want to be looking for a new job if the situation in the market is not very good, we might have a case at which it will be possible that they will accept the situation. All right, so let's now try to understand the other categorization of unemployment, the distinction between natural and cyclical unemployment. As we said earlier, the economy always has some unemployment. 
In addition, the unemployment rate fluctuates considerably. Okay, so we do have some unemployment and we see that unemployment goes up and down. We saw a graph like that uh, in the previous lecture. This is the unemployment in the United States from 1969 till today. And you see that there is an average level and then you almost, in very few occasions, you do have unemployment equal to the average level. In most of the times you just fluctuate around the average level. Now, the average rate of unemployment is usually referred to as the natural rate of unemployment. This is a long-term uh, average in unemployment. It is calculating by taking the average over an extended time period. For example, if we consider the natural rate of unemployment to be the average of the almost 40 years between 1977 and 2018, we are going to figure out that unemployment, natural rate of unemployment is very different from country to country. Uh, this would be 6.1% in the United States, while we saw last time that in uh, Spain, for example, that has very high unemployment, traditionally, the natural rate of unemployment would be around 15.6%. What is different there, maybe you have different frictional unemployment because it takes more time to find a job in Spain, or most likely, maybe it is because of structural reasons. So the, the market in uh, Spain, for example, would have much higher degree of rigidity in adjusting W than in the US, that W can fluctuate a little easier. All right, so uh, cyclical unemployment is the first kind of unemployment that we have. It's defined as the deviation of the unemployment rate from what the natural rate is. Cyclical unemployment rises when you have a period of recession and falls when you have a period of expansion in the economy. This is because of shifts in the labor demand. If you have a recession, you will decrease the labor demand all firms will decrease the labor demand. If you have an expansion, then firms will be looking for new workers, hiring uh, as much as they can. In this case, labor demand will increase and you will have unemployment to go down. Cyclical unemployment now contains both frictional and structural components, meaning that cyclical unemployment might be due to structural or frictional reasons. You don't know which is the composition of the two. Uh, again, the two taxonomies of unemployment are not mutually exclusive. So for example, if I take all students from my class, I can classify them as uh, male and female. Okay, so this is one classification. Another classification would be to classify them as those who wear glasses and those who do not wear glasses. All right, so these are two different classifications, but they are not mutually exclusive. If you belong to the category that you wear glasses, it doesn't mean that you uh, uh, belong to the category that you are a boy or a girl as well. So you might belong to more than, uh, you have to belong to two uh, of these categories that, that I, uh, I said before. So the same thing here. Cyclical unemployment can be frictional or structural. Uh, contains both components there. So during recessions, for example, fewer firms hire. This increase the difficulty of locating the best job for you because there are fewer offered positions right now. And then uh, this would cause the time of you being between jobs to become longer, increasing the frictional unemployment. Another way to see that is that during recession, less jobs are offered. And this, if the wage uh, is rigid and cannot go down, this would make structural unemployment to exist. So you might have, because of a recession, you might have unemployment that is frictional and you might have unemployment that is also structural. So the four categories, again, of unemployment, they are not mutually exclusive. An unemployed person can be unemployed for uh, one or more than one reasons. 
So this is with respect to unemployment. I want now to start a discussion about crisis, economic crisis. Let's start from the Great Depression, which was one of the most important periods in the modern economic history. We're talking about the 1920s in the United States. The United States was emerging as a winner from the World War I. Troops uh, came back from the war. Women had already joined the labor force and we had industrial production that was at unprecedented levels. Uh, the economy was booming. Households and firms, they were enjoying fairly high incomes and everybody was looking for a way to invest their earnings. So we're talking about a period where the middle class as we know it today or a little better than what we know it today was emerging back then. Average households were making a substantial amount of money uh, given the, uh, what they were doing that far. And then this means that they had some excessive earnings that they wanted to find a way to save them. And in other words, they wanted to find a way to invest income so in the future they will be able to enjoy security of, by being able to, to have future income. So investing in the stock market became very popular. And uh, back then, you could hear people talking about the stock market, not only the ones that they were working in the stock market, the financiers, the bankers, all these people of the white collar banking sector, but you could hear from, from the butcher in your neighborhood, from the tailor about, oh, which company are you investing in? Which stocks do you buy? People who would check the prices very regularly. Uh, stock market became something like the gambling of, of that time. And of course, a lot of people who went into the market, the, the demand for stocks increased by a lot. So this means that prices of, of stocks would uh, actually start uh, increase. This at least was what uh, the people expected. And this was what uh, pretty much happened. Till 1929, the stock market was up by more than 200%. This, again... Uh, fed this vicious cycle. More people wanted to, to go in investing their money in the stock market. At some point, even the banking sector decided to use the deposits in order to play in the stock market, in order to kind of gamble in the, uh, in the stock market in a speculative way, meaning that they were looking to just go in and very quickly have some profit. They did not expect for these companies to become uh, uh, profitable and to, to share dividends. They were just looking for prices of stock to appreciate so they will resell them and they will be able to take profit and pay also the deposit to people and then the uh, profit will stay uh, with them. So back then, this um, uh, should be seen as a very slippery slope, as a very risky strategy to follow. And this is because even people who were sane and conservative and they did not want to risk, those people, they would just leave their money in the bank but then you had the bank that they would gamble with the money. So even the people who were conservative and they did not want to risk, or even those people that they said, you know what, it's not that balanced to all of us to just go and buy shares and we will inflate the values of these companies. Uh, instead, let me keep my money to be safe. Even these people that they kept the money in the banks, the banks used the money for what they, these guys didn't do. They used the money to play in the stock market. So um, consumption, uh, on the other hand, started decreasing. Why is that? Because if you're making some good income and you see that, oh, by saving this income, and playing it in the stock market, I will have much more money in the future. This will make you sacrifice a little bit of your consumption now in order to have consumption later after you will make a lot of money from playing in the stock market. So consumption went down because people preferred to use their money to play in the stock market, not because they didn't have money. So this decreased consumption in some way. Uh, consumption is what... Uh, 
was supposed to give profits to those firms that they were uh, the stocks of which were negotiated into the stock market. So those firms, they saw that their stock prices are doing very well, but they don't have a lot of demand for their products because people preferred instead of, instead of buying the, the products of the companies, they prefer to go ahead and, and buy stocks of this company, buy shares of these companies. So companies uh, slowly started decreasing uh, production because they could not sell what they had. And this, of course, was not very good for profitability. So the stock prices were high because a lot of people wanted to buy the shares, but the earnings of the company were very small because the company didn't sell anything since people did not want to buy the product, they just wanted to buy the company. Okay, so this created a, a, a disparity between, between the two things. Now, when firms cannot earn much money, they start cutting uh, wages. So wages started falling fast, interest rate uh, increased in this case in order to, uh, uh, to start to, to slow down what was happening in the, in the stock market. Uh, those who had borrowed to invest in the stock market, they were already started to uh, be in trouble. So there, we had a lot of people that they did not only playing the stock market with their money, we had people getting loans from the banks in order to play in the stock market. Once the wages go down and the interest rate increase, these people now are in trouble because uh, it's kind of hard to be able to pay back the loans. Still, even though you had all these bad signs, for several months, the stock market kept going up as if nothing was wrong. So you would see that in the stock market, uh, nobody cared for the fundamental variables of the economy. They said, ah, economists are actually talking about some kind of recession that is coming up, but I, the only thing I see is that the stock market is going up. So this made a lot of people to fall asleep on the wheel, and economy st still was going um, with um, uh, the speed that already had. It was still going up until October 24, 1929. That was the exact moment that the roller coaster had made it to the top of the ride, and here is what, what followed. Within a few weeks, stocks lost the one-third of their value. This doesn't necessarily mean that every company lost 30 or 33 percent. This means that most companies, they just became totally bankrupt. They just, they, they, they lost, the shares lost their entire value right and there. So we have photographs from those stock markets that people, the financiers, left the stock market that the next day and the day after, and the stocks that back then they were not, of course, electronic, they were in paper, they didn't even bother to take them. The value went down to zero and they dumped the papers on the floor of the, of the stock market uh, house and they, they left. In the next three years, Stocks had lost 90% of the value. So even good companies, companies with high profitability, they would see their stock values going down. Okay, so, so after three years, we are talking about uh, a, a, a stock market that lost 90% of its value. The problem was with commercial bank. Commercial bank had heavily invested in the stock market, so they lost a lot of money. This was not their money. This was the money of the depositors that they had played in the stock market. And now it was not possible to return the money to the depositors. So depositors, uh, in some cases, they got back only 10% of their savings. So even if you were very conservative and you wanted to save your money in the bank, you lost your money, not because of your own choices, but the choices of others that you trusted your money with. So um, banks went bankrupt, and then uh, people were able to get only 10% back of their total uh, deposit. This is something that, uh, if losing your job is devastating, imagine working for your whole life and uh, uh, sacrifice 
your now consumption because you wanted to save some money for the future. And you would see that you are losing all these effort, the, all, all these fruits of your effort for so long time and you lose them just because some other people made wrong decisions. So for me, this is the, the worst thing that can happen, not for you losing your job, l- losing your life's savings. This would be something devastating. So um, depositors got back only the 10%. Unemployment reached the highest level in U.S. history. That was 24.9%. This is a level that made uh, a lot of people to queue up in bread lines and and, uh, homelessness became a common sight. Uh, There is a lot of homelessness uh, even today in the United States. Maybe homelessness is higher today than it's back then. However, a lot of homelessness that you see now in the United States has to do with a lot of other factors, like, for example, mental disease or mentality of some specific uh, people and and much less of people that they just want to have a better life and they, they just cannot afford to have a better life. So back then, people were forced to become homeless. They lost their houses one after the other. The crisis lasted till the beginning of the World War II. It didn't, it didn't uh, last for a couple of years. So you see that uh, uh, the economy bounced back after the World War II open new jobs that they were uh, relative to the to the to the war that was happening so uh, it's not a, a stretch to say that uh, adolf hitler unfortunately was the one who pulled the united states out of the recession not its own politicians its own politicians however they they did things laws were introduced to to safeguard financial institutions and deposits uh, to prevent banks from speculating with deposits. So there were very uh, strict regulations for, for the banking sector in order what they can and what they cannot do with deposits. Franklin Roosevelt, who was the president back then, created the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation. This was a, a trust that wanted to reinstate trust to the, to the banking system. So it was an organization that they uh, they actually would cover losses that they had to do with deposits of people up to a specific number. So it was an insurance for uh, for deposits. It uh, uh, formed also the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, which was an organization, an institution that monitored the function and policed the conduct in the stock market. So this is, uh, of course, even today, very relevant in the American economy. And every economy has a commission that overlooks uh, the stock market, in which is independent of the government. It's something like the central bank of the stock market, let's say. So there is this commission that actually polices the conduct in the stock market. So it took a long time for the economy to get out of this crisis. Fortunately, there were lessons that they were learned and institutions, regulations and laws that were put in place in order to prevent this from happening. And we should expect that once you had those, you should not expect to see situations like that ever again. And we believe that, we believe that the economics now has the tools in order to be able to stabilize the economy, to prevent crises, to prevent difficult situations, and that we will not see a situation like the Great Depression ever again. And we strongly believe that till 2007. 2007 was when the global financial crisis started in the world, triggering the other crisis that we will talk about today, the Greek debt crisis, they are not the same thing. They are fundamentally different. So let's see what happened in the 2007-2009 financial crisis and how was it possible once we knew so much about how the economy works. In the years leading to 2007, several new unregulated shadow bank institutions had appeared. These were institutions that they were doing what banks were supposed to be doing, 
but they did not call themselves as banks. They, they advertised as if they are a financial institution that does not do what a bank does. Like, for example, they would not accept deposits from the public directly, so this doesn't make you a bank. Uh, if you, however, accept other banks to buy your products with the deposits of the public, that's a very different story that was not covered by the regulations that we had so far. So there were several shadow institutions that they were offering financial services. Those institutions started offering a series of uh, a new innovative financial product. What they did was extremely smart. Look at that. The most successful product that they had was packaging together high-risk mortgage loans. In finance, one of the aims of every financial institution is to be able to control for the risk. If you give, for example, 100 loans and 10% of them, they go bankrupt and they cannot pay you back either the installments of the loan or the capital of the loan, you're going to lose a lot of money. So you want to be able to handle your risk effectively. And this is one of the key problems that you have in finance. So those uh, institutions, they offered a solution to this problem. Uh, and this solution was by grouping together in one product loans. So what they would do is that they would take a lot of loans, they would examine which of them are low-risk loans, and then they will not deal with them, but they will buy all the bad loans, the loans that they had very high risk, the sub prime loans, as we call them, and they will put them together in one product, group them together, so you could not buy them individually anymore. You could not actually give them to somebody individually and anymore. So uh, by doing that, you actually achieve to control the risk at an aggregate level. Of course, you cannot affect the risk of each individual loan, but you can affect the total risk by pulling them together. Let's see how this works. If you have a subprime loan with a high probability of default, 10%, then the creditor of this loan faces a significant risk, not only to lose the interest from this loan, but to lose the entire capital that has loaned out to this particular person who got this loan. So this is a very high risk. It means that in 10% of the cases, you will be bankrupt yourself. In 90% of the cases, nothing will happen. You will be okay. But you would not do something very risky if they tell you that you have 10% probability to, to fail. Okay, so that's not uh, a, a good risk, especially when you give out loans. However, if you take this loan and you tie it together with another 999 such loans, then what will happen is that approximately, because now you have a thousand loans, you should expect that 10% they will fail. 10% they will default, and 10% they will never pay you the interest, never pay you the capital back. So you will lose your money from 10%. That's not very bad once you have the other 900 loans that can make up for the losses that you will have from the 100 loans that they will go back. So if you pull all the loans together according to the law of the large numbers, you will be close to the probability of 10% for default. So 10% of your loans will default. And then in the 90% of the cases, you will be able to make up for the losses from the other 900 loans that they will not default. So in this way, even with subprime mortgages, loans, these loans particularly that we had trouble with in 2007 were mortgage loans. So therefore, uh, even with these high-risk subprime loans, you can find your way out with the risk. You will charge them a higher interest rate. And if you control with the risk effectively in this method, then instead of facing a risk of 10% for going uh, bankrupt, what you actually do is that you uh, uh, have a profit all the time because the 100 loans that they default will be subsidized from the 900 loans that they will not default. Such products work particularly well in principle, 
But those who understand from theory of finance, they know that there are three important exceptions. First of all, the function of these products is based upon the law of averages, meaning that if each loan has a 10% default probability, it means that if I have a lot, on average, 10% of them will default. This is something that holds true most of the time, meaning that it holds true in normal times. If you have a 10% probability of default, 10% of your loans will default only in normal times. If you have really bad times, like for example, a virus is coming up or the whole economy goes into a state of recession or something like that, then the probability of default will be correlated between all the loans and all loans together, they will start defaulting. So it's not as if you have many, many loans with same probability of defaulting, but not all of them will default at the same time. Now you have, again, a bunch of loans that they will default if the economy goes into recession with a much higher probability than 10%. So we didn't have normal times back in 2007, and to this, it helped the exception number two, that the alleged safety of those products incentivized the banks to give more such loans. So the banks will have an incentive and say, why do we care if we give loans to anybody? Let's just give loans to even a McDonald's worker who wants to buy an $800,000 house. Why should we not give them a mortgage? We don't care if they don't pay it because what we're going to do when we give the loan, we're going to sell it to those shadows institutions that they would package it with others and then sell it as a, an entire batch of loans to somebody else. Okay, so they didn't care to just check to make the loans to be prime. They said, if we sell a mortgage, even if it is prime or subprime, we still make a profit. So it urged the banks to give more subprime loans. The third one is that the oversupply of loans led to speculation in the house market, inflating the house prices. Actually, this was the reason why the McDonald's worker wanted to buy an $800,000 house, because he was not intending to serve the loan. He was intending before the loan started being payable in the first installment to flip the house. And since the house would be appreciated in value, then in this case would make the profit, pay off the loan and keep the profit. So you had a lot of speculatory behavior because everybody had access to credit even McDonald's workers who could not really justify of, of taking such high loans. Uh, the bank didn't care much because they would keep the value of the house, the house itself as a collateral. And they said, if this guy doesn't pay the loan, then we will confiscate the house and we sell it to somebody else. Uh, but now, according to number three, you had the values of the house to be inflated. Meaning that if you had given a loan for a house that cost around $800,000 in California, this house costs that much, not because that's its real value, it costs that much because everybody wants to buy it and to flip it. When this goes away, houses are going to fall very much in value and this will create a depreciation in the value of the collateral. So, you had appreciated a house for $800,000 when you gave the loan. Now that you will take this house back, this house will not cost $800 anymore. Now it will cost $300. So how are you going to make up for the $500,000 that, uh, that, that you actually gave out as a loan? So you had all these three factors working at the same time. And in the first sight of the recession, defaults in mortgages snowballed. So we started seeing not only one or two or three or 10% of defaults that we were expected, we started seeing defaults of 30, 
40 and 50 percent of such mortgages, especially from all those who had bought the houses, not because they wanted to live in them, they just wanted to flip them later for a higher price. This actually caused a situation that the banks who had invested so heavily in those products, they could not survive the losses. So all these mortgages that they had to be paid, they would not be paid. This will allow uh, for everybody who sold them to have a profit, but then those who bought them, they would not have a revenue from the installment payments of the uh, mortgage payments of those particular loans. And they saw that they could not actually get their money back from those investments to these particular products. So the banks had invested heavily in those products and some of them could not survive the losses that they had. Uh, government and the Federal Reserve Bank, which is the central bank in the United States, they came to an ethical dilemma. What should we do? Either bail out those people by using taxpayer money, of course, or would have the economy to sink because as economists predicted, if you allowed those uh, uh, banks to default, to, to go out of business, a lot of people would lose a lot of their uh, uh, hard earned money and this would be a very big problem. So uh, it was a very difficult evening uh, back then in 2007, Friday night, uh, the Lehman Brothers uh, uh, closed and then uh, when the executives left their offices, they didn't know if they will reopen on Monday. During the weekend, the situation became dramatic. They said that there is no way of being able to save the bank and they decided to go for bankruptcy. The 2007-2009 crisis was basically a repetition of what went on in the Great Depression. They both started with a bubble. In the Great Depression, the bubble was the stock market. In the 2007-2009 crisis, the bubble was the housing market. Both of them became possible because of regulation gaps in the financial markets. In the Great Depression, you didn't have regulation that the banks could not speculate with their deposits. In the 2007-2009 crisis, we didn't have regulations that if you act as a bank, you should be considered a bank and be under the regulations of the Federal Reserve Bank. So shadow banks should be regulated by the Federal Reserve Bank as well as normal commercial banks. So the 2007 and 2000 crisis, however, it lasted way less because it was extinguished by policy from the government and from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank. So they used stabilization policy, expansionary monetary policy. They decreased the interest rate as much as they could. And also the government gave a, gave a, a bailout a program that was 0.8 trillion back then, one of the biggest in the history till then that helped the economy to, to get much better quickly. Later, they came up with a second bailout program and a lot of money, more than 1.5 trillion, went into the market in order to prevent the situation from becoming worse. So economic theory helped the situation a lot we knew what to do, it took time, but we were in a position to fight this successfully to a point that didn't create, at least in the United States, did not create a lot of, a lot of problems for later. And after two or three years, the economy was able to bounce back to its original state and continue from where uh, it had left. Now, the Greek crisis started in 2008, in um, late October, of 2008. Till then, uh, Greeks were looking uh, at United States, watching it through the news, and they were like, okay, that's something that happens there, and it's we are not concerned that much over here. So till 
uh, the mid 2008, the the global financial crisis were uh, for for Greece were just a part of the news. It was not a part of their everyday life. Let's take things from the back, though. Uh, the Greek crisis was a systemic crisis. So Greece entered the eurozone. It adopted the euro as a currency from the beginnings of the euro in 2002. So Greece was a founding member. By then, the country uh, already had a high government debt. This high government debt was because um, uh, leftist governments from before, from the 1980s, they had uh, uh, they, they implemented a habit in the economy of spending a lot for uh, for public services. So you had uh, uh, a decade in the 80s and in the beginning of 90s also that Greece wa- went very hard to an expansionary program. The government was spending a lot of money. Taxation was uh, fairly low and you would see a lot of money would go, would go into, uh, into the economy. Liquidity was very high. But this was paid by just uh, the uh, government having the central bank to print money and to circulate the money into the economy. So they were doing seniorage, as we we already saw from previous lectures, a couple of lectures ago, and they were funding the government debt, which means that since you are printing money in order to finance your debt, you should expect inflation rate to be very high. And indeed, inflation rate back in the 80s and 90s in Greece, it was something between 8% when it was the lowest, up to 25% when it was the highest, but it was controlled. So the government knew that there would be inflation. It was hyperinflation with today's uh, 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 situation, but in general, uh, back then, it was kind of a normal level of inflation, a little high, but normal for many economies that were in the state that Greece were. Now, after the introduction of the euro, things changed a lot. Inflation and the interest rate fell drastically. This is because Greece uh, could not print its own money anymore because it adapted the euro. So you could not use seniorage anymore, but that's not a big problem because now what you can do is that you can finance your debt or even finance uh, more government spending with cheap loans. Why? Because the euro is a common currency. It's very, very steady, non-inflationary currency. If a country that is a part of the eurozone sells a bond, gets a loan, in other words, this loan will be very attractive. And because you consider that these loans have very low risk, since the currency is non-inflationary, then in this case, the interest rates will be very, very low. And indeed, the interest rates that Greece could uh, uh, get its loans to finance its debt and its government spending was something between 3 and 4%, super, super cheap for, for the time. Till the mid-2008, the country was living on loans. This means that the government would issue a new series of bonds just because they had to pay their Christmas bonus to the public servants or just because they had uh, an unexpected expense because of a small natural disaster and things like that. While they were doing that, debt kept piling up. Now, this is not a big problem until you think that the rest of the world was already in a big crisis. After the beginning of 2007 and 2009 global financial crisis, investors all over the world started becoming overly cautious to who they lend their money to. In other words, they became much more risk averse with respect to financial assets. At that moment, the Greek economy had the debt to GDP ratio at 117%. This means that Greek owed 117% of its yearly GDP. That's an extremely high number, at least back for the time. Today, this has been something around 160% because GDP went down dramatically and many other reasons. But back then, this was considered one of the numbers that you do not really want to lend money to somebody who has this debt-to-GDP ratio. 
Within months, bonds issued by the Greek government, they were rated as trash. We, we call those as toilet paper bonds. So the international organizations that they rate bonds, because there are thousands of, of government securities out there, every government issues government securities every time, and you need somebody to tell you which ones are good, high, uh, low risk, and which ones are high risk. Uh, so you have um, uh, independent companies that they just do that. They, they rate different securities. So Greek government securities, they were rated as trash. Interest rates exploded because the prices of these bonds, they, they fell uh, uh, dramatically over the, the next few months. So interest rate uh, became something like 30%. So it increased from 3 to 4% to 30%. As you understand, you cannot receive a loan anymore. And if you receive this loan, this will not allow you to finance your debt because this will make your debt to explode for the future. So Greece was in the middle of a very deep recession with nothing to fight it. Found itself helpless in the eye of the cyclone. They could not do monetary policy because they did not have any printing privilege. The printing of money was with the ECB. The ECB did not care just to print euros and to send to Greece because this would be against the anti-inflationary policy of the euro. So Greece could not do any monetary policy. Government, on the other hand, could not do expansionary fiscal policy because they had no money. Actually, they had negative money for the moment. For some, uh, several, several months, they were discussing in the news if the government will be able to pay the public servants and the pensioners in the end of the month as they would uh, do every uh, every year before. And uh, in some cases, the money were delayed and people were living in a much high uncertainty back in the time. So Greece found itself in the middle of a depreciation with nothing to do about it. So what happened? An alliance was created by the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, and the European Commission. They, all three of them, got together and they decided to bail out urgent loans for Greece. So Greece will not go bankrupt and this would create a big problem for the currency, for the euro. So they built out only the urgent loans, the loans that they were expiring, and they offered only one way out for Greece. They said, this is money that we give you now in form of a alliance loan. You will have to pay also this money back. So we keep the interest rate low for you under one condition, that you will do austerity from now on. And uh, austerity is not a nice thing for politicians to say to people. Now they had the international alliance to directly say that to people and things started became, becoming very ugly. Within the 10 years of the crisis, because this uh, was a crisis in an economy that had many fundamental problems, this was an economy that could not live on their, on their own powers but had to to receive loans in order to be able to finance the lifestyle of the politicians mainly, but also the people in this economy, because people in the economy, they would vote for these governments that they would promote their uh, uncontrollable spending. So within the 10 years of this crisis, because it still goes on much less today, but still the economy has not recovered. It's very far away from the point that it was 10 years ago. Uh, GDP contracted by more than 30%. So people lost one third of their income. Unemployment exceeded the 25%. So in terms of unemployment, you will see that this was much worse than the level of the Great Depression in the, in the United States. At some points, unemployment in Greece was 28.5%. Because of strong family ties, they were able to uh, not have social results like the one uh, they had in uh, United States, but in general, this was devastating for the economy. So we had a lot of cases of 
families that uh, uh, knew uh, couples that they had moved on their own, they had already a kid, and then they had to go back and move with mom and dad. And mom and dad, uh, in some cases, they would go and they would go to the, to, the, to the summer house that they had in order to live there permanently. And you would have situations like that. So rents went uh, much lower. Prices started decreasing. This hurt the incomes of almost everybody. Infrastructure deteriorated. You had the public health deteriorating. The streets de- were deteriorating. Uh, the the uh, traffic light will have a, a broken uh, bulb and then they will not fix it for, for several days because they didn't have the ability of financing the labor and the, and the materials that needed for all these repairs of infrastructure. Six governments were changed. Now we are in the seventh government after the crisis. The average life of every government was to one year and four months. Suicide, the rate of suicide increased by 1,000%. So this to show you that economics is not just about the finance, it's not just about the numbers, the rates and everything. It's about lives. So we're talking about people that they lost everything within a few months. They lost their entire life's savings. They lost almost everything. The banks closed uh, in uh, 2015 after an intense negotiation of the newly elected back then government with the European Union. The banking system entirely collapsed. There were capital controls in Greece. Perhaps you have heard of all this uh, in the news. And this was a, a very difficult situation for the country. Today, the only hope for the country is tourism, exports, and the foreign investments. At this point, I want to cover two special topics. One is about stagflation, and the other one is about a situation called the liquidity trap. And this is just an exercise, a practical exercise, so we will make sure that we understand the theory of economics as best as possible, because now these are some topics that they are kind of very interesting for the times that we are we live in, and I think that they will be useful to know them. And since we already have the necessary tools, I want to go over and examine them. So let's assume here that we have a labor market like the one we had before. And I want to see what is going to happen if I have this market that let's assume for for the moment that has zero unemployment. So we equilibrate at A, uh, at a point where the labor demand and the labor supply are equal to each other. And I want to see how an increase in government spending, that is expansionary fiscal policy, will affect the economy. Because now we know that Expansionary fiscal policy creates an increasing tendency for the GDP, increases output, and this is something that I want to see if it has any limits. Can it happen all the time? If government keeps increasing G, will I keep seeing that the economy will expand and expand and expand? So assume that the government increase the government spending. This means that the government will demand more products in order to buy with this government spending and firms have to produce these products. If firms need to produce more, they will need more workers. Therefore, we should expect that the demand for labor will shift to a new position. Let's assume that it shifts to D1L. And at this position, we have the labor market to equilibrate at W1 star higher than the wage rate before. So we'll have no rigidity, no problem for the economy to accept a higher wage. We only have rigidity downwards. We have no problem increasing the wage. Uh, You will not have a case that workers will go on a strike just because their bosses want to increase their salaries. Okay. So therefore, what we see here is that we have the economy to work at full capacity at L upper bar means that this salary is high enough, W1 star is high enough so that those uh, workers here 
all of them, they decided to join the labor market. If you keep increasing the wage, nobody else will enter. What will happen if you keep applying expansionary fiscal policy after that point? Further increase in government spending will shift the labor demand more. So labor demand will increase to a point DL2. Firms will demand more workers. Firms know that there are no other workers out there. But by increasing the demand means that potentially, if somebody that wanted to work at this wage was coming to me, I would hire them. Okay, so firms increase the money demand. This doesn't mean that uh, this will lead to a higher equilibrium, but in general, this would still increase the money demand even though the economy is already at full capacity. If this happens, of course, no new workers are there if we assume that we have no immigration or nobody else can, can come and work. So this means that the new equilibrium will be at point C. At point C, there is no increase in GDP simply because there are no more workers to produce the extra GDP. So you should expect at C to have the same GDP like in B, but the wage rate will be much higher. So you have no increase in employment, but on the other hand, you have increase in the labor prices, and this is going to create inflation because more money will be in the hands of the workers without more product to be able to be there. So we saw when you have increase in money, but you do not have increase in GDP, you do have inflation. This particular inflation is uh, one of a kind. We call it stagflation because we observe inflation and at the same time we see that the economy is stagnant at the same time production level. So we take the word stagnation and inflation, and we have created one word which is called stagflation, and it represents a situation where you do have inflation without having increase in um, GDP, without having GDP growth. So this is a, a, a slide that can show you that there are limits to expansionary fiscal policy. The government cannot magically keep increasing the production even though they do have a cost of fiscal policy which is in terms of debt as we saw last time. They cannot keep increasing their, uh, uh, their economy by just spending more money just because the economy has some natural limits and you cannot exceed those limits. The next application I want to talk about is the liquidity trap. So let's remember a little bit the money market now. We have a money supply, a money demand, and they equilibrate at an interest rate that was implemented by the central bank, R not star. So this is the initial interest rate that we are at equilibrium. Notice here that I'm not only giving you this convex shape of money demand, but I'm giving you also its continuation. So at some point it becomes completely parallel to the horizontal axis. I told you previously that we have specific reason why we draw this curve in a convex manner. And today we will uh, explain exactly, as I promised you, why this is the case. So assume now that the central bank conducts expansionary monetary policy by decreasing the rate to R1 star. How are they going to do that? By offering more money to the economy. So they will increase the money supply to M prime S. They can go up to there and still decrease the interest rate. If they give more money supply than M S prime, this would uh, not cause the interest rate to go any further because then you will reach the flat segment of the money demand. So let's see what happens up to B. Of course, if you are up to B, uh, the interest rate will fall. You will go to R1 star. At R1 star, you are going to activate link Two, this will uh, increase investment and then you should expect that your economy will have a higher output. Now, if you keep increasing your money supply and you want to go to C, what's going to happen? A lot of people, among which several economists and some of them with PhDs that they have key positions, will tell you at least 
till five, six years ago, they would tell you that this would create inflation. Actually, I had this discussion with many colleagues several times, and back then it was controversial. Nowadays, it has been solved once and for all, and I will show you how. So if you increase your money supply, at this point, you cannot decrease the interest rate anymore. So the only thing that you're just doing is that you dumping a lot of money into the system and this actually should be expected to create inflation just because you infuse the system with more and more and more money and you should see that prices should go up. But we were saying from back then and somebody, uh, some people back then, they didn't believe us that these situations like this would not cause inflation. Okay, situations like this will not cause inflation. Why is that? See where exactly is the catch, if you can get it. If you keep giving money into the system, how do you give the money in the system? You actually allow the commercial banks to have access to cheap money from the central bank. So the central bank, in other words, takes it, prints money and gives it to the commercial banks and tells them, here, loan it out so it will become investment. All right. However, the commercial banks cannot do that. Why? Because the interest rate is already too low. When you reach this flat segment, your interest rate is too low. In some cases, this flat segment is very, very close to zero or even equal to zero. So when you have the interest rate to be very low, it means that you cannot find more worthwhile projects that they will yield a return more than the interest rate. So the commercial bank says, okay, I have money. The interest rate is very low. This money is very cheap for me. I don't mind to loan it out to R1 Star. The problem is that I cannot find anybody who with a reasonable risk will give me, will, will invest the money in something that will have a return above R1 star. In other words, again, the economy is very close to full capacity. There are no more good investment projects out there. There was enough money for all people to take their opportunities. And now the ones that they want to get loans at this very, very low interest rate are the ones that they have these crazy projects that you don't really believe that they will go well. So what happens? The money that is between B and C, this huge quantity of money here, will just be deposited back to the Federal Reserve Bank, to the Central Bank, as excess reserves. So the the bank will be like, okay, give me the money. All day they will find nobody to loan it out. So in the end of the day, they will deposit them back to the Federal Reserve Bank as excess reserves. So this extra money will never make it to the system, will not circulate in the economy, and therefore prices will not increase. We call this situation the liquidity trap. This means that you are already having enough liquidity in the market. If you keep increasing the liquidity, this liquidity will be retained into the banking system, will not make it to the real economy, you will not see inflation. We had observed this in Japan for several years, in the previous decade, but still a lot of economists, they didn't believe that this would happen in the United States now that they are reaching very low interest rates. They didn't believe that it will happen in Europe now that it already has a a zero interest rate. And this is what we were saying from the beginning, that do not expect inflation. Inflation will not happen just because this market will never circulate out into the real economy. So, When the economy is in the liquidity trap, monetary policy becomes ineffective, meaning that you do throw money in the economy and then the economy throws the money back at you. Okay, the the money doesn't make it to, to be used in something. So the interest rate approach is zero. Banks cannot find reasonable risk projects for using the the money, and therefore the banks will deposit the new money back to the central bank as excess reserves. How will banks make money in this case? They will make money by just turning into fees. So they will charge you for services. They will be like a retailer of services 
of the banking sector. So they will charge you every time that you use your credit card. They will charge you every time that you visit the cashier. Uh, I asked for a certificate of... Um, uh, of how much money I have in, uh, in the bank a few days ago from OCCB, they told me that this costs $30. I'm like, are you crazy? You just want to just give me, print out a, a paper that says how much money I have in my account and sign this and you will charge me $30 for that? And they were like, yes. And I was like, okay, I need to send this to three recipients so just make it to whom uh, it may concern. And they were like, no, no, we cannot do that. We have to write the name of the recipient on it. We cannot do, do it to whom it may concern. And therefore, you have to pay three times $30 for each. Okay, so they turn into charging for services in order to make money. While in past times, the banks were actually doing all this for free just because they were wanted you as a customer, because they wanted your money to lend it out. Now money is in excess. They don't care for that. They don't want to attract you for that. They can afford to lose you by charging you these uh, higher prices and, uh, for services and you can uh, actually tolerate that because you have nowhere else to go. So the new money will never circulate into the economy and therefore prices will not increase. In this case, you can have situations where the uh, Federal Reserve will print dollars and the European Central Bank will keep printing euros and still you will see that you will not receive inflation and increasing prices in this economy. We will conclude today's lecture with international trade, which unfortunately is going to be our last topic for the course. I want to discuss international trade because it's one very good way of approaching one of the big questions, the local versus global. What is what makes civilizations, nations, countries, societies to stay local or to go global? There might be several answers to this question. Some nations, they go global just because of cultural reasons like it was, for example, in the ancient Greeks' culture to do trading just because they got used to see everything as a trading opportunity. The trade in ancient Greece was one of the main reasons that this civilization could be funded. It was the fuel of this civilization. So Greeks saw everything as an opportunity to trade, and the money that was coming from trade was what actually created this civilization that we all today have benefit. There are historical reasons, even later, when you had your fathers and your grandfathers and all your ancestors to do trading, then in this case, you would also get acquainted to the trading world and you will want to do, to do trading. There are geographical reasons. Why? To begin with, ancient Greeks wanted to do trade, were so good in trade, because the geography actually allowed for that. So the, the Greek states were isolated far apart from each other. You had little islands that in terms of kilometers, they are close to each other, but they are isolated from one, to, from one another. And you need to trade goods in order to have a good standard of living, and therefore, from that need that came from the geographical construction of the country, you had uh, the, the citizens to become good in trading. You have political reasons that answer this question as well. For example, one of the major topics, maybe the most decisive topic of the previous elections in the United States between these two guys, one of the main discussion topics in their debates was if we should have a trade war or not. But finally, one way to give the answer in a more precise and scientific way is to try to find out the economics behind this question, to understand what urges people, what makes trade to be attractive and what makes trade to be dangerous in other cases. So let's examine the economics of trading. Once and common, today, foreign products are everywhere. Countries import anything, 
from toothpicks up to electric cars, anything you can imagine can be imported. Nowadays, it's not even easy to tell where products were made. Take, for example, the most iconic United States product, the iPhone. Where is the iPhone made? Uh, uh, it's designed in California. That's what it says on the box, at least. It's assembled in China from parts produced in Korea, Germany, Japan, and the US, from resources extracted in Russia, South Africa, and many other countries. So where is the phone made in which country? So this is a, an interesting question. Services follow a similar pattern of outsourcing because a, a large portion of today's economy is the service economy. And we see that even there we have significant outsourcing, customer support. You buy a printer in the US, you don't know how to install it. You call customer support. You are connected to a little village in India where almost the whole village works as a phone center connected with uh, customers in the United States in which they, to which they offer support. Uh, services that can be communicated electronically are outsourced in different countries routinely today. And this is not something that just happened in the era of the internet. If you have seen the the very popular show, The Simpsons, uh, it's actually played and voiced in the United States by American actors, but the animation from a very long time, from the beginning of the show, I think the second season and later, it's uh, done in South Korea. In South Korea, they, they are doing all the animation for The Simpsons. And even in the 80s that the show first began, you had one member of the, of the production that they would get all the initial designs for how they wanted the, the animation and they would travel with the airplane to South Korea. They would stay there till the production would start and then they would come back and another member of the production would go with the next episode and they will do this back and forth. Today, the entire thing happens online with, with communication through uh, electronic means, but still... Back in the time, you did have outsourcing of services that they could be communicated electronically. They didn't have internet, but they could put the animation into one uh, uh, Betamax cassette and they could uh, send it to the US with a post. This again is electronic communication as we mean it here. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the history of trade. Uh, let me show you what went on in the past century. So this is the volume of exports in uh, uh, from 1900s up to 2014. You will see that we start with a very low uh, trade and we gradually increase and we see something that looks like an exponential increase of trading until after the uh, global financial crisis, we see some uh, period that stabilizes. So we have three different periods here till the 60s that we had a normal growth from the 60s till the global financial crisis that we have an explosion, a hyper-globalization progress of, of trade there. And then after the global financial crisis, we have observed a situation where trade has stabilized. This looks as a story of continuous growth. All right. However, the situation is not exactly like that. The story of trade is not a story of continuous growth. It's mostly a story of ups and downs. I want to show you again the same graph, but now I want to show you the volume of trade as a percentage of GDP. And you will see that because the economies back in the 1900s were small, we see here a very different picture. So the picture that we see here is again that we have three periods. We have a period of trade up to the beginning of the recession in the end of 1920s. And then we see that for the next few decades, the trade has been lowered significantly. All right. And then after the beginning of 70s, we see that the trade again increases at a very rapid degree. Let's discuss a little bit about that. What happened before 1959? So it was possible to have global trade after having in place 
several basic technologies. And do not expect to tell you here about the internet or about the, the, the electronic inventions. It was nothing about that. Trade, world trade became possible once you had three basic technological advancements. The railroad, the steamship, and the telegraph. All right, so telegraph made communications uh, much easier, so you could communicate and tell others without a lot of trouble what you wanted and how much you, you would pay. And then railroad and steamship made the transportation much easier. So this was the, the initiation of global trade. Now it was possible uh, for somebody in England to buy Chinese tea at the store in 1910. This was a routine purchase in, in England. You could buy tea from, from Ceylon, Sri Lanka, or you could buy uh, tea from, from China, or you could buy uh, Greek cheese that was coming from Greece. These were things that they were possible to do back then in the 1910s. So the beginnings of the global economy were in fact more than a century ago. It was not 20 or 30 years ago. Global trade is not a new thing at all. Between the two world wars, international commerce was reduced significantly as a share of GDP. For this, it's the war that had an impact, but it was not only the war. The most important reason why we saw trade to go down in this period was that we had a period of limitation of trade through tariffs, quotas, and different other legal restrictions in order to protect the local interests or in order to avoid trade with some specific countries for some other, in many cases, also political reasons. What happened after 1960s? So there has been a significant increase in world trade from 1960. This was supported by two new technological breakthroughs. And again, it's not the internet that actually caused that because I, I, I have taught this class live several times and every time students answer. So the internet was what made it possible. So the internet is a, a relatively very new thing and we're talking here about a situation that happened in 1960. So we had the two technological breakthroughs that you are not, you have all seen them repeatedly some of you, perhaps you can see them right now if you look around you in the room, at least the second one. All right, but let me tell you which ones they are because you will never find it by yourself. The first, believe it or not, was the box. The standardized container. This was the container that you see today everywhere in the streets. Uh, carried by trucks, the same container can be loaded in trains, the same container can be loaded in airplanes, in ships. Ships can actually stack this container exactly uh, one over the other. And you will see that this standardized size of this iron box, this very simple invention, made trade much easier. Now, you didn't need to take, for example, bags of corn or pack chairs in pallets or pack books into boxes and all this. You could put everything in the container and the container would go to the other side and the same container could easily be loaded and unloaded on a truck, on a railroad, on a ship, on an airplane, almost everywhere because of its standardized size. The second important invention was this one, the barcode. The barcode is around from the 60s, and by scanning these little hieroglyphics there, you can figure out in a moment where this container is coming from. What does it have inside? What kind of storage you should have? Where it goes next? Where its final destination? Where it should, when it should be there and under what conditions? So everything became possible in this little code. Every container had one of those. Every product today has one of those. And this is because it can make transportation and the logistics of trade much, much easier. So till the 80s, the increase has been moderate relative to the size of the economy. But after the 90s, especially in 1989, where China opened up for the world trade, international 
commerce increased rapidly, and this is a period that sometimes we call it the hyper-globalization. Today, there is some evidence that international trade has leveled off. This is something that, indeed, we have observed for several years. It's not because of the crisis. It's not because of Trump's war. It's not because of the policy against trade. Mainly, it's because of technology. So today, we have methods of technology that they are capital-intensive, meaning that the reasons that you had so far in order to outsource your production to countries that they have lower wage rates, it's not anymore that relevant because now you produce everything with robots. You don't need a lot of workers. The workers that you need, they are very specialized and therefore it's a smaller advantage now to outsource your production in a country which has a lower wage rate than uh, domestically. So therefore, we see a leveling off of trade, and now we cannot predict how the situation is going to be evolved, but I will not be surprised if we have an era, we enter an era that uh, trade as a percentage of GDP will start be going down for the advanced economies. So what is the economic driving force behind the trade? Trade allows a division of labor and specialization. Specialization makes the world richer in two ways. First of all, allows for concentration on what you do better. So you can concentrate on your talent and this will make you more productive. Now, once you do the thing that you are more productive, you just do more quantity of that. So therefore, you can even take advantage of some economies of scale. International trade is exactly similar. You don't want to grow bananas in Russia because it's cold there. You don't want to extract petroleum in Italy. The only oil you can find in Italy is olive oil, no petroleum, so you don't want to do that. The country doesn't have an advantage in this kind of production. Same way that you don't want to go uh, for winter sports in Singapore uh, just because it's hot here or, or something. All right, so each country has different talents. Uh, it's good for production of one thing, not good for the production of another thing. So you do have this uh, situation to happen in individuals, but also in entire countries. That specialization allows for the division of labor and allows for things to, to become better and makes the world richer. Now, uh, in 1817, David Ricardo, uh, this guy here, this is a, a, a picture that I don't know if it adds any information. I think he looks like every other guy of that time. So David Ricardo offered the first example for the benefits from trade. So he was the first economist who actually uh, tried to understand what happens with trade. So uh, Ricardo has started with an example. He said that, uh, assume that England is better in the production of cloth and then Portugal is better in the production of wine. So this was the actual example that he came up with. And uh, he said that uh, if we have this uh, situation here, so this is um, uh, the map of England, this is the map of Portugal. Uh, if you don't know about Portugal, it's the country that Cristiano Ronaldo is from. That's the, the, the best thing that is, uh, Portugal is renowned for uh, till today. So, um, if you have these two countries and one produces better cloth and the other produces better wine, then you probably uh, understand that you can actually have England to focus in the production of cloth and then Portugal to focus in the production of wine. They can produce better qualities and more of each. And then they would trade the surplus uh, with each other. So England will give some cloth to, to Portugal, and then Portugal will give in exchange some wine to England, and they will be better off. In this case, when England is better in the production of one thing, and Portugal is better in the production of the other thing, we say that the countries have the absolute advantage, meaning that they can produce a good using fewer resources. So the point here is that they produce a good using fewer resources. In other words, they have a lower cost. Now, let's assume here that England is better in both. At least this is what David Ricardo 
assumed because he was English. So in his example, he assumed that England is the best in everything. Uh, is there still gains from trade? Do you want to trade if one country does uh, both things better? Do they still want to trade or do they want to just uh, uh, go in autarky? Autarky is when you rely only on your own production. So you don't import anything. You just say, I'm going to produce everything I need by myself. Autarky. Okay, it comes from the Greek word aftarkia, which means that when yourself is enough. Okay, so that's um, uh, a little bit of, uh, of uh, language lesson here. So if England dedicates all its resources to the production of a single good, all right, if it produces, for example, only uh, cloth, it can produce 100 units, or if it produces only wine, it can produce 80 units of wine. All right, if Portugal dedicates all its resources to the production of a single good, it will produce 50 units of cloth or 70 units of wine. So what you can see here is that if they dedicate all their factors on cloth, then England produces more. If they dedicate all the factors on wine, again, England produces more. I have put everything together in this little table here so we have all we need uh, with just one look. England can potentially produce more of both, 180 versus 50 and 70 for Portugal. And this is because England can produce a unit of any of the two goods using fewer resources. So given that, let's assume that those countries, they have the same resources, since England can produce more, it means that it uses less resources for each good. Now, let us, however, check also the opportunity cost of each good, because if you produce wine, only wine, you give up the opportunity of producing cloth and vice versa. So what is your opportunity cost of producing one good or the other good? Let's investigate that. All right, so if England concentrates on the production of cloth, it will produce 100 units of cloth and it will forgo 80 units of wine because they dedicated all the resources on cloth. Every unit of cloth, therefore, costs 80 over 100. So you give up 80 for 100 units. This means that for each unit of cloth you produce, you sacrifice 0.8 units of wine. I want to have this information because it's the opportunity cost, and I will keep it in my table next to the production. So for England, the production of cloth costs 0.8 units of wine. If England dedicates all its resources now in the production of wine, they will produce 80 units of wine and they forego 100 units of cloth. The opportunity cost is 1.25 if they do that, 1.25 units of cloth. And this is the opportunity cost of wine and cloth in England. Now in Portugal, if Portugal dedicates all its resources in the production of cloth, it will produce 50 units of cloth for going 70 units of wine. This means that each unit costs 70 over 50 equal to 1.4 units of wine. That's the opportunity cost of a unit of cloth for Portugal. And similarly, one unit of wine produced in Portugal will cost 0.71 units of cloth in Portugal again. So now we have also the opportunity cost and we see that England has a better opportunity cost for cloth and then Portugal has a better opportunity cost for wine. So maybe after all, there is the opportunity for the two countries to trade here. Let's see if they can trade, if they want to trade. First, cloth. It costs 0.8 units of wine for England to produce, and it costs 1.25 units of wine to Portugal. So it's cheaper in terms of wine to produce cloth in England than in Portugal. For any terms of trade of cloth between 0.8 and 1.25, let's assume that they decide to trade one-to-one. -one. So I give you one wine, you give me one cloth. This is one-to-one -one terms of trade. 
if the terms of trade is one, this is between 0.8 and 125. It means that England would benefit from selling cloth to Portugal because they are selling the cloth for one and it costs them 0.8. So they have a benefit. Portugal would benefit from this transaction too because they will buy cloth for one instead of making it themselves that it would cost them 125. So they are saving by buying it from England. Exactly the same happens with wine, actually reversed. Wine costs 0.71 units of cloth to Portugal and 1.4 units of cloth to England. So for any terms of trade of wine between 0.71 and 1.4 units of cloth, so Portugal would benefit from selling wine to England because it costs them to make 0.71 units of cloth and they can sell it for one unit of cloth in this case to England, so they make a profit. And England, on the other hand, would benefit from buying wine from Portugal because it will cost them 1.4 units of cloth to make it, but they will buy it with only one unit of cloth if we buy it from Portugal. So therefore, what we have here is again, they will want to trade. So there is opportunity for mutual beneficial trade. In other words, we will have England to sell cloth to Portugal and Portugal to sell wine to England and both countries, they would be better off. Let's see an example with that. Assume first that each country covers its own needs with autarky, so we have no trade. And let's assume for simplicity that the two countries, they will split their resources half and half. Half of the resources that will be dedicated to the production of wine, the other half in the production of cloth. This means that England can do 50 and 40, that's 50 half of 100, and 40 half of 80. So they will have 50 cloth and 40 wine, and Portugal could produce 25 cloth and 35 wine, again half and half. So this is if they do not do trade and they dedicate the resources half and half to the production of each good. Let's see now what happens if we allow for trading between the two countries. Assume that they are trading with terms one to one like we did before. This is an assumption of mine for this example. If you want, you can assume different terms of trade as long as they are between these uh, margins that I showed you in the previous slide in order for trade to be profitable for both. One is a number that is between those margins that we saw in previous slides, so it works, but there are other terms of trade that you can adapt if you want. One to one is easier for me, that's why I will assume this one. So Portugal now can produce 70 wine, so dedicate all its production in wine, produce 70 units, and keep only 40 units for domestic consumption, meaning that they will export the other 30 to England. Why do I choose to keep 40? Just because I want to keep a number that will may be better off from what I had before. So before they were consuming 35 in autarky, I want to show you that trading is better, so I assume they keep 40. So in wine, Portugal does better trading than no trading. All right, that's one thing to consider. So Portugal will trade the other 30 units for 30 units of cloth, so they will have also 30 units of cloth. So automatically now, Portugal is better off with trading because before they could consume 35 wine, now they consume 40, and they can consume 30 cloth while before they were consuming 25. So now, with trade, they can be both better dressed and more drunk by allowing trade. So trade is good. All right, at least for Portugal. Let's see what happens in England. England can produce 55 cloth. Wait a second. England can produce 100. But let's assume they just produce 55 cloth, all right, for domestic consumption. 
and another 30 cloth, okay, so that's a total of 85. They still can produce 15 more, but let's assume that they, they just produce 55 plus 30. They will keep 55 for themselves, so they will be better than before because before they were consuming 50. So that's why I assume that they will keep 55 for themselves. If you want, you can assume here that they will keep 51 for themselves. It still works, but I assume 55 just to, to, you know, to be large here. Okay, so England will produce 55 for itself and it will produce another 30 of cloth to honor the trade agreement that they had with, uh, with uh, Portugal because they have to give them 30 cloth, as we said, in order to get 30 wine. All right, so this means that England has 55 for itself. It's already better off than before because before they were consuming 50 cloth, so now they have 55, good. And they will trade 30 cloth for 30 wine. So now they have 30 wine also. But if they have 30 wine before they had 40 wine, so now they're worse off. No, because they still have some resources left that they are enough to produce its own 12 wine. So let's try to put everything now in a new matrix here and see how it works. So first let's put what each country gets with autarky. So the orange color here is autarky. So we have 50 and 40 for England and 25 and 35 for Portugal. And now, Let's see what happens with trade. Portugal will produce 70 total units of wine, but it will keep 40 for its consumption. And this means that they will produce zero cloth by themselves. Then England will produce 55 units of cloth for itself. And it will also produce 12 of its own wine. And then we also have the agreement for the trade 30 to 30 for both of the two. So now the total consumption under trade for England is 55 instead of 50 and 42 instead of 40. And for Portugal, it's 30 instead of 25 and 40 instead of 35. So we see here that both countries consume more of both goods if you allow trade, even though England has the absolute advantage in the production of the two goods. What is the reason that this can happen? Even though you have the absolute advantage, you still want to trade with somebody who you have the absolute advantage in the production of this particular good. All right, so what happens here? We see that England has the absolute advantage in the production of cloth and the absolute advantage in the production of wine. But Portugal has the comparative advantage in the production of wine. You have the comparative advantage in something if you can produce it at a lower opportunity cost. So here, England has the comparative advantage in the production of cloth and Portugal has the comparative advantage in the production of wine. And that's why still trade is able to happen and be beneficial for both countries. Now, trade causes inequality. And I want to discuss briefly about it. In general, trade brings change to the society. In the long run, as we have seen, we have more winners than losers. So everybody is a winner in this case. However, in the short run, the situation is a little more complicated because there can be a significant number of losers. Take, for example, the situation when China opened up for trade in 1989. In general, the US and Europe became richer on average. They became richer not because they made more dollars, but because with their dollar, they could buy more goods because they were coming from China that had the comparative advantage in the production of labor-intensive products. However, trade hit a lot of local communities with unemployment. 
So these little factories and small businesses that you had in the US, now they were replaced by businesses that they were in China that they could produce the same thing at a much lower cost. So this hit a lot of local communities with unemployment. So the costs and benefits of trade, they were distributed unequally. If you were living in New York and you were, you were a computer programmer, you were benefit from trade. If you were living in Oklahoma and you had a job in the uh, plastic production factory, you would see your job moving to China and you would be unemployed. So you wouldn't have the benefits and the costs to be equally distributed in the society. Now, I want to show you a very interesting graph, perhaps one of the most interesting graphs that we have seen in the entire course. I want you to consider these uh, two axes here. On the horizontal axis, I want to show you the percentile of global income distribution. If you are, for example, at 50%, it means that 50% of the population makes less than you and 50% of the population makes more than you. If you are in the 70%, it means that you make more than the 70% of the population and 30% of the population makes more than you. If you are the 99%, it means that you make more than the 99% of the population and only 1% makes more than you. So this is the uh, horizontal axis and this is at the global scale. The population of the entire planet is here. And we start from the left where we have the very poor and we go towards the right where we have the, uh, the global elite. Now, on the horizontal axis, we have the percentile of global income distribution. On the vertical axis, we have the percentage increase in real income. And I want to show you how much the income of this particular income percentiles changed from 1988 to 2008, within these two years. So what was your income if you were at that percentile in 88 and what it would be now. So I'm showing you the change. Okay, I allow for changes from minus 10 to 90%. And if you consider the data that we have, you will see a picture like that. Let's connect the dots also. So we get this graph right here. Now, I don't know about you, but this uh, uh, reminds me of something. Uh, write down in the comments what this shape here kind of reminds you. Okay, a lot of people come up with the same, uh, with the same thing. I want to just see if you will find what it is. So let's look at this data and let's try to understand which percentiles benefit and which percentiles did not benefit in those 20 years that the main shock in the economy was the opening of the world trade, the hyper-globalization. Towards the middle of the graph in this particular area, we see the higher uh, benefit from, from the new era of trade. This is the middle class of developing countries. So middle class of developing countries till back then didn't even exist, but now it, uh, it does exist. And uh, they have seen a very high change of their income just because they were the recipients of, of increase in, uh, in their part of the economy, mainly due to trade. Whoever else benefits here, the usual suspect from benefiting almost from everything is the global elite. So we see that the global elite also benefit a lot. Now, if you consider that if you are in the 100%, you had an increase in income of 60%. If you are in the 100% percentile, your income uh, is so high that an increase of 60% maybe would be a few hundreds of billions of dollars or something like that. So we're talking about very huge increases. Don't forget that the amounts that we have here are percentage increases. So if you're making a dollar a day, a 45% increase is 45 cents. If you're making 100 billion a year, a 45% increase again here is 45 billion. Don't forget that we measure percentages here. So the global elite and the middle class of developing countries, they were benefit a lot. Who are the losers? The usual suspects 
us every time are the very poor. The very poor lost from uh, this because they saw their already very small income to not really increase a lot. And then we have this very interesting part of the graph here. But who is here? Who is in the 75 to 95 percentile of income in a global scale? It's actually the middle class of developed countries. So this is what we hear every time in the news, the squeeze of the middle class. The middle class of developed countries, they saw their income to not increase almost at all. And if you are in the center here, there is a few billion of people from Europe and in the United States, North America, and many other areas that they belong to this uh, percentage right here. And those guys, they even saw their income to go down. Okay, so this is something that actually troubles us because we saw, okay, the global elite did much better. So the middle class did much worse. The very poor everywhere, they did very uh, much worse. So we had only the global elite and the middle class of developing countries to benefit from trade. This doesn't seem very fair, especially for the middle class of developed countries. So this intensified inequality made the middle class of the developed countries to become disappointed, to turn against globalization and to drive a political change. So this was the reason why we saw phenomena like economic nationalism and all these radical parties that they appeared in Europe and things like that. Donald Trump, Brexit, radical parties gaining power in Europe. In Greece, you had the fascist party that uh, made it to the parliament after many, many years that nobody was voting for them. They found ears for their theories to be heard. Unfortunately, they did not make it in the parliament in the last elections, but for 10 years, they were the third political party in the Greek parliament. And the reason for that was that you see that the middle class people that they're working hard, they tried to earn their life, they saw that they do not benefit from the changes that the political elite had implemented. All right, so you have phenomena like that. So what should we do? Should we roll back globalization? Trade, indeed, is a contributing factor in inequality because it brings change. Now, it's not a dominant contributing factor. Everything about trade is true for every other economic change. Like, for example, technology brings change. Nobody asks, however, to roll back technological development. Nobody says, okay, uh, I think the internet's fault is that I don't have a job today. Let's stop internet. Nobody says that. But they do say that for globalization. Reversing globalization would be very difficult. So if you would try to reverse it with a trade war, with tariffs, with all these things that Trump tries to do today, and Brexit, actually, uh, the, the leader of, of Britain is, is also supporting, is creating another reverse shock for the economy. Shocks are never good. And this is going to be bad because tariffs on intermediate goods already we start seeing that they disrupt entire industries. So the United States, recently they put a lot of tariffs in metal that comes from, uh, imported from, from the East. They put tariffs on that, so they try to make it harder for Eastern exporters to export metal, uh, iron, and uh, steel in, uh, in the United States. This automatically, after a few months, created a problem to the car manufacturing industry in the US. A lot of people lost jobs there. Uh, also, communities have largely adapted. You had this little factory that closed back in the end of the 90s. Now what happened is that the people there have even become pensioners. They have even migrated somewhere else or they have been retrained. So why do you want to start opening that? This happens with a lot of coal factories today in the United States, coal um, uh, op operations that they, uh, that they extract coal uh, and factories that they actually process it. So communities have largely adapted. Uh, factories have closed. Technologies have evolved. People have left 
or it trained. So trying to roll it back is not going to work because the economy is not waiting at a standstill to, to bring things back. The economy has evolved, has already adapted. But trade is special. Global trade is often villainized by politicians. And let me tell you my opinion about what the reason is that um, the arguments are not economic. They are social, they're cultural, they're historical, and they are political. And um, as for every change, it is possible to mitigate the adverse effects of trade. The thing is that if we want to do it, so we can have direct transfers of income from the winners to the losers, we can have public goods like healthcare, education, and infrastructure to mitigate the adverse effect to those who were harmed by unemployed. We can create incentives for relocation or retraining to people that they lost their jobs. And we can create safety nets like unemployment insurance, minimum income, guaranteed minimum income or food stamps. All these are things that they will mitigate the problem. The question is, if we want to implement them or if we say, oh, you lost your job because now we allow trade, it's your own problem. You should have thought about it from before. But we end up talking about trade in a very different way because trade crosses national borders. And it's not easy to accuse somebody for your problems like Apple or like IBM or like Facebook or like Intel or like Ford and Tesla, it's not easy to accuse them because they brought technological change, which also created losers and winners. It's much easier to accuse for your own problems those people that they are on the other side of the border, that they have different color of skin than yours, that they have different religion, that they believe different things, they vote for different leaders, and you have all these historical differences with them. It's easy to put the blame on them than to take responsibility for your own politicians in order to try to do things better and to mitigate the problems with all these reasons and to make the losers to get a little bit of the share that they deserve because of this change. This is all. Uh, it's the end of the material. It's the end of the course. It's the last time that I see you. It's um, a little bit of a sad time for me. Uh, it was a very weird semester, the weirdest in my life. I, I literally don't know what to say because uh, you are a class that I didn't have a chance to get to know very well. I usually get very connected with my students. I, I care for them a lot. I want them to, to grow and to become better. I try this through my course to, to make it as easier for them to perform well, not because of the grade, just because I want them to learn something useful. And the most important satisfaction that I get is when I see in my students' faces the, uh, the aha moment, that when they connect the reality to the science and when they learn something new. And this is what uh, made me turn to the academia. It's a little uh, difficult to do that through a camera. I I love it when the videos get views and they get likes and they get comments and, and students care, but still this doesn't show me your face and how well you perform. So you're the class that I, I briefly had the opportunity to, to know, but uh, I would still feel great if you guys take advantage of this. That was the best I could do in order to keep the quality of the material delivery at a level that will be what I think that my students deserve. I hope that you liked it. I hope that you learned useful things. And I want to wish you the best for the future. Very quickly, I will send you information about the final exam, how we will organize this. Uh, I think that we have the know-how and the means to conduct a, 
a good final exam in terms to be fair and to assess your knowledge on the material. I want to assure everybody that nobody will get less than what you deserve. My students get always what they deserve and plus a little more there from me uh, when, whenever I can. I want to guarantee to you that your assessment will be at the same standards like the previous students. I will keep contact in that. I, I hate uh, saying goodbye. I'm going to be in Singapore. You will be here anytime that you want. Uh, come and see me. Enjoy reading about the material. Try your best. Uh, try to see it in, an, in a way that it triggers your interest because this will become less boring. I am sorry if I bored you. I, I tried to make a few jokes in the first recordings, but then uh, when I was editing the material, it seemed a little awkward to me. I'm not that good of a comedian to be able to uh, make people laugh if there are no people around or I don't see their reaction. So I apologize for that. I understand that there were a lot of shortcomings with this method of delivery. Anyway, what you have to do is try as hard as you can, try your best to study the material, do your best in the exam, whatever is that best of you, and then leave the rest to me. So, goodbye and good luck.